obsession, someone you can't live without. I say fall head over heels. Find someone who can love like crazy and who will love you the same way back. How do you find him? Well, you forget your head and you listen to your heart. And I'm, I'm not hearing any heart because the truth is, honey, there's no sense living your life without this. To make the journey and not fall deeply in love, well, you, you haven't lived a life at all. But you have to try because if you haven't tried, if you don't, just keep you, going. You have to try. Because if you haven't tried, you haven't podcasted. That whole time I was staring at Griffin, dewy, dewy eyed like Claire Falani. I thought you were going to hum the score under I, I, I think I would have embarrassed myself. I think you would have nailed it. Yeah. It's hard to do Hopkins doing 50% of an American accent. I don't think it's easy to do Hopkins, period. He's, he's supposed to be from Newfoundland in this, right? <laughs> like he's, about got, halfway. he's got this mode that I feel like we all just accept. Where he's like, I just, I sound like Anthony Hopkins. I'm not full Welsh. Right. I, I was about to ask, like, what is the most American he's ever, like, had to play? Richard Nixon. <laughs> right? Am I wrong? <laughs> I'm not. I guess so, but then, right, he, he played most that as American, like... not greatest American. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, 10 comedy points. But Nixon, he kind of was like... Look here, you know, I, 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 yeah, I'm from California, but he still sort of has the well. Hmm. I agree. Well, who was he in the world's fastest Indian? That's that's a pretty American. Uh, in movie, that film, right? I believe he played the world's fastest Indian. <laughs> he played a talking car in that one. That one's actually about a talking car. <laughs> uh, acting credits, list of Anthony Hopkins performances. Let's just mm -hmm. roll down this list and like. Is there someone called like Cowboy Jack in here? You know what I mean? Like, am I forgetting about someone? You've introduced David in the past. The Blank Check Hall of Fame. Certain actors across our nine years, we've covered across They've multiple miniseries. Up, right. In, in, you never, it's not that one director liked them. Lots of directors and have put them. And we've covered a yeah. weird array. And if you look at the six performances or whatever, we have covered a weird swath of Hopkins now. You did the whole Hearts, Hearts in Atlantis season. We did. We did one season just. <laughs> early in early podcast. We days. did one yeah, Hearts yeah. in Atlantis minute. <laughs> yeah. Where we went through it one minute at a time <laughs> and pretended it was the only Stephen King adaptation ever made. No, we d we've done Silence of the Lambs. We've done Amistad. Sure. This. He's played two presidents. Right. Yeah. Spoiler, we have already recorded our Elephant Man episode, which will obviously come in the fall. An excellent performance. And kind of his first movie breakthrough, at least in American film. Obviously, Silence of the Lambs is like complete transcendence. Mm. I think there's one other... Oh, well, we've done the Thors on Patreon. No acting required. You have the Human Stain Patreon coming up. If we did a Philip Roth Patreon, I'm just saying, there's juice there. The hey, only problem is all the movies are bad. Juice? Did you say? <laughs> yeah, they're juice there. I just want to clarify you said juice. I have, I've been <laughs> fired as a professor <laughs> Look, for saying there was juice in the <laughs> Roth series. I'm an American professor. Uh, I have at, never seen The Human Sting. Looking at I've read the book. It's a fantastic book. The Graftrion book. Patreon charts, uh, podcast charts, rather. If we did a Philip Roth series, we'd probably go up to number one. I think, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's, but we were like, this man had no flaws. Right. That's how he gets number Finally, one. Finally, these guys are pissing on the third Gillis whale. would be inviting us on. Hey, Five million dollars a month. Hey, you want to talk about Philip Roth with us? The pod against AmeriCast. Yeah. I mean, it, it writes itself. Are there any other Hopkins we've covered? Uh, Mission uh, Impossible 2 on Patreon. Sure. Uh, yeah. Which is which, the ultimate oh. paycheck mode. Yeah, he right. really gave a shit in that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, did he care so much about the performance he sure. gave. Sure. Um, Amistad, we have yet to do Zorro, although we must. Yeah, we are the two popes. That's a competitive advantage. We mm -hmm. are. <laughs> you and I. Which is which? Which is which? Yeah, I, who's Benny and I who's Fran you Frankie? Yeah. They should have called that movie Benny and Frank. Have you not done Dracula? No, we've no, never done Coppola. Feels kind of inevitable in some form or another that we will levels. cover that movie. I guess so. Or uh, Patreon series Hot one. Monsters Who Fuck is my has been my other pitch mm -hmm. for a while. You haven't we done Ed Zwick. We'll eventually do we haven't Zwick. Ed uh, uh Ridley Scott. We haven't you know, lit the Zwick. We'll do Ridley Scott and do another Hannibal. Sure. We could do Oliver Stone and get some Alexander in there. And and some, some tricky well, Richard. My, my favorite Hawkins performance. We're forgetting, of course, Beowulf. Beowulf. Yeah, there it is. There That's we go. Right. Well, how could we it's forget okay. that we forgot that? I don't know. David, David, come on. I just don't remember that he's in it. Um, Wolfman will do one day. Joe Johnston. He's in that. Sure. Uh, Hot he's Monsters in that. Who Don't Does Fuck. Does he know he's in it? <laughs> Probably not. He, I don't know. Spoiler for those who haven't seen the Joe Johnston Wolfman. Uh, Anthony Hopkins turns into a wolf in that movie. And? and Fights his wolf son. And? Does he do a good job? 
I would I want to wager that he is not the one under the makeup. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> I want to say that Anthony Hopkins was not really in the last 20 minutes of narrative of that film, but his character wolfs out. I think we'll do James Gray someday. Armageddon Time, a wonderful performance, a performance by I Tony gave my, my Blanky Award for Best Supporting Actor. I mean, think we'll definitely do a Michael Bay series one day. And he introduced us to the last night. And introduced us to... <laughs> Cogman. His Is psychopath it? butler, Cogman. So, the human-sized robot who does not transform and beats fish. We've we've overlapped with him many times, mm -hmm. and we'll overlap with him many times more, but he has uh, conclusively never convincingly played an American in his 50 years but, of acting. But I would argue is a perfect example of someone where that doesn't fucking matter. There like, was a, a, like Brian Cox in Succession. Yeah. There was another actor I was just thinking about where I'm like, I don't think they've ever actually successfully done an accent that overrides their national natural speaking voice, and I don't care. Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson's a really good example. A lot of these guys, it's just like, it's gravitas, and it's also that they attack these things with a lack of embarrassment. And I think if you don't see the actor struggling with the accent, you just accept it. Like, confidence goes a long way. I think the accent thing is, we just have to buy it in the movie. Yeah. People who get really mm -hmm. hung up on the direct accuracy, like like Jodie Comer and the bike riders. I, if that's not exactly Chicagoland, like, I don't really care. I like it in the movie. Now, I believe it in the movie. As David was very eager to start this episode, because as he said, this is one of the richer texts we've covered in a long time. I agree with this. We're starting Hopkins heavy, but I want to put forth this, this point about this movie. In 99.9% .9 of actors' careers, this performance would be at their absolute top tier. Even in a movie that was this derided and largely forgotten. I hear what you're saying. Sure. Right, 99.9% .9 of people putting in this performance, you'd be like, holy shit, he tapped into something incredible in this. Just the absolute presence. And Hopkins' standard of quality is basically so good that you're just like, yeah, this is in the top 50%. Maybe. I think this is truly... Seen is in his kind of phoning it in era. He's so fucking good in this. I think he's good in the film. Do you think he's good in the film? You can say no. I think he's good in a good movie. Yeah. I Wow, this podcast. <laughs> Banner, you're going to have to resist. What's up? Did you like me, Joe Black? Which we'll, we'll introduce the show and the guests and you everything else. You seem a little else. out of sorts, Ben. <laughs> oh, no. Ben. Yeah. I just locked into it. Ben, Ben Haas. <laughs> uh, yes. for, for the listener, Ben is standing still, yeah. kind of looking at us a little oddly and speaking slowly. His tips are not frosted, but no. imagine if they were. You seem a little confused by the room you're in right now, as if suddenly. And you know what? I just picked up on the reference you were making in your sound check, Richard. You weren't even here, or were you peanut here? Butter. Yeah, peanut I butter. Was yeah, no, I, here. I, I forget. Oh, yeah. I, let's just go around. I want to say, I think Anthony Hopkins is good in a good movie. David? Did I like the movie? I think he's good in a good movie, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Listen, this is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. It's a podcast about filmographies. David, what are you, what are you I'm struggling just like, with? I'm just, How are we going to talk about this? No, we can talk about it. I think there's lots to say. Yeah. It's just kind of crazy that we're all like... Coming into land, three planes in a row <laughs> with like a <clears throat> good movie. And the air traffic control is like, what's going on? You're, like, go around. Go around. <laughs> Your letterbox yeah. log was, what if I don't hate this? And it right. felt like the internet started sharpening their knives. Like, huh? And perhaps that's a better way of putting it. Like I, I unilaterally do not hate anything right. about this movie. Not, but like not since Marwin have I been watching a movie being like, I can feel my appreciation for this bubble. You're insane for that one. I maintain you are still insane, but this is a podcast about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers, such as making a blockbuster so big, Netflix is making sequels to it fucking 40 years later still. Has anyone seen that thing, Axel F? Is it no. out? For all I no. know, it's out. That's the thing with those Netflix They just did coming. their big premiere and they're, everyone's on their fucking press tour and I think it comes out like a week from when we're recording this. Yeah, it comes out July 3rd. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. You know what I fucking hate? All the uh, posters they have up around New York City for Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. Okay. Say, uh, coming exclusively or streaming exclusively on Netflix, plans starting at six ninety nine a month. Yeah, what a bummer. There, there's now like a dollar sign underneath their fucking posters. Great company. Anyway, they're giving right. a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Boy, does this qualify. 
this is this this check was so blank it was clear. Yes. <laughs> it was just like there was not a check actually. It was just they just opened a vault and like right. they just they it. were like, here's yeah. the blank check, yeah. but they were just handing over air. <laughs> yeah. Pure air. It's a miniseries on the films of Martin Brest. It's called Podverly Hills Cast. And today we are finally meeting Joe Black. At long last. Is this the first movie you guys have done where literally a studio head got fired because of it? Well, it's a this great is, question. I, I do think that studio heads have been fired for some of the things we've covered. Let's call right? out though. This is the same season. Fall 98 mm. is the same season as Babe Pig in the City. And that is the two punch that gets them fired. Mm. It's both right. the movies we've covered now. Right. Mm. I, I was reading. I think he was fired before Babe came out. But I think it was such a disaster. Like I think it was tracking badly or something. Yeah. And so they were just like, you're out of here. Yeah. And that was it. Who are we talking Who? about here? Casey Silver, I think right. his name was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, he was... should have met Joe Black. <laughs> his career sure Why did. settle for silver <laughs> when you can Casey meet Joe Bronze. Black? I think I've seen this movie. Ben is staring very intensely at a cop. Oh. As if he's never seen anything like Then you're kind of like the Bluey episode born yesterday. I'm just going to say. That's mm -hmm. kind of what you're doing, too. I know no one here has seen it, but uh, just for the too? listeners. Ben looks incredible today. He looks good. I don't I mean, know what it is, but good. he's glowing. His eyes. He looks <laughs> dead, so richness. but good. He just said nutted butter to himself. <laughs> There's like the, the lights like are catching your eyes so beautifully. Or I guess the other way around, maybe both. And when I asked you guys how you know Ben, you were really cagey about it and said he's just an associate and we of took, yours. And we took 20 minutes yeah. to say his full name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ben. Ben, good name. Oh, yeah, I like that oh, name. beautiful ben. name, Ben. Shout yes, out for the yeah. name Ben. Yeah. Mr. Hosley. Ben oh, Hosley. okay, so that would make his name Ben Hosley. Course, okay, right. okay, all right, all right. right. Just that there's a peanut gallery being like, Joe? Oh, huh, Joe, mm -hmm. Joe, that's a name. Mm -hmm. That's a, No one can deny it. And uh, is there any more? Or are we done? Or? He's, a, <laughs> he's a pro. Uh, pro, no, he's no, a pro no, 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 no. doer. Mm -hmm. That's enough of that. I don't even want you to start on that road. <laughs> Three hours later, yeah. Griffin finishes. That has to be the nickname. Yeah. Is just meet me, Ben Hosley. <laughs> meet <laughs> Ben Hosley. Fine, <laughs> sure, great. Ben's posture cool. is incredible today. By the way, I just need to keep calling out certain mm -hmm. physical attributes <laughs> of Ben's <laughs> body language. The way he's smiling is more Clifford than this is true. He's doing a gilly. I would say <laughs> it's a gilly. Yeah, that's what it is. I miss gilly. Bring her back yeah. to do a Nick Weiger bit. Bring her back. Bring her Gilly. back. Bring her back. Uh, our guest today returned to the show for... Oh. Do you want me to check? I don't know, actually. It might be the 10th time. <gasps> oh, no. It's more than that. No, maybe. it's more than really? that. Really? Yeah. 12? Yeah. Right, let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13th time. A Goodman's Dozen. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, because you forget Button. You... And I think that was my last Mabulant pit yeah. <laughs> are hand in say, hand. You got a bit of a running theme now. Yeah, I'm locked in on on Brad Pitt's uh, weirder pro epics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I do Legends of the Fallen? No. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah right. we like this right. Wick right. series. Yeah. yeah but... Um, it, it is. It is. I kept doing this mental exercise while watching this movie. It just speaks to how, like, the particularity of the time in which a movie comes out. Mm -hmm. Where it is in everyone's career, mm -hmm. where the industry's at, how audiences are feeling, where you're like, you could absolutely see the reputations, or let's not even say reputation, the at the time receptions of Ben Button and Joe Black being completely flipped. Uh, sure. That's interesting. For yeah. both movies, mm -hmm. I would argue existing in a current similar status yeah. in legacy. You could be like, oh yeah, Meet Joe Black got nominated for like 13 Academy Awards, made $150 million, and everyone is kind of puzzled by it now. Right. Versus Benjamin Button came out, was a big flop, and was sort of totally blanked by awards bodies. I guess so. Both had sort of fraught productions, <laughs> right. right? Like, yeah. They both exist in a very similar zone now. It's true. Except Weirdly. Benjamin Button was not on my cable, uh, my college cable movie channel. So I haven't seen that. And I believe this was my 10th time I'm seeing Meet Joe Black. I'm sorry, your college cable movie channel? There was, like a, there was a channel Boston at Boston College, college Well, it was, no, it, was, it was many universities. Oh, like, sure. Paid yeah. the same thing. And it, just, it they picked, they added like four or five new movies every uh, once, uh, I think it was once a month. And they would just play on repeat. Right. Hell Arts was like this. So like it was mm -hmm. Hannibal yeah. one year. It was uh, Meet Joe Black was definitely on there for some reason, even though I was at, that was years after I was in college or, or like the movie came out before I was in college. Rather. I feel like this thing was on TNT all the time. Yeah. I've watched sections of it. I'd never watched it in full before. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I've seen this movie so many times. And part of it is, I, I've said this in other episodes leading up to this in the series. Richard Lawson, by the way, Vanity Hello. Fair, Little Goldman. 
Happy to be back. Hi, Richard. As such a breast fan, who's so dismayed by the latter half of his career, mm. yeah. I've always resisted watching this because I wanted to believe I would secretly think it's good. But there's the Schrodinger's cat effect of like, if I watch it, I'll know for sure. And what if I don't like it? I think the thing about watching this movie in the context of how you guys are watching all of these movies is you're like, oh no, Gili is the thing that did it. Like this was probably a heartbreak for him, Joe Black was, for Breast, but like, and a frustration. But like in the in the fullness of his career, this is not what killed him. But also Son of a you Woman know? is a disaster. Well, that's true too. That's not a good movie, but it was a success. It, it was, was a success. success. And it won a big Oscar. It was the wrong yeah. kind of success. This film is better than Scent of a Woman. Unquestionably. Oh, I think so. Right it, out of the gate. For gates. one thing, it's not called Scent of a Woman. <laughs> For one thing, Al Pacino never once yells about pussy in this movie. It's true. He actually does. You just can't hear him. He's just, he's in the background. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's not mic'd. <laughs> he's yelling. Just running around. I wanted a hoo -ah from from or something, but yeah. Other than that. No, that movie is uh, horrendous. And you're just sort of like, how the fuck did Breast make this? Whereas for all of its peculiarities, this movie makes sense as Martin Breast trying to make a prestige film. Sense yeah. of a Woman feels like all of his instincts are off. And this is like warts and all in line with the first four films of his, first three films of his career. It certainly feels very tied to going in style. Hot Tomorrow's and Going in Style, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the first four. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little less so to the, you know, fun movies that entertained people, which I cannot deny this movie is not fun and entertain nobody. No, but I like, do. You know, that, 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 those are the issues with the film. I think Scent of a Woman is like maudlin in ways that make me want to vomit. Yeah, and its sure. comedy is galling. I think this movie, what is now its main legacy is clips of it going viral. And people yes. are like, what the fuck is this? I didn't even know this movie existed. Is this yeah. a bit? And in context of the movie, all of those scenes are admittedly insane. But within the context, you understand the intentional comedy that Martin Brest is aiming for there. Whether or not he pulls it off, you can question yeah. it. But if you take yeah. those scenes on their own, you're like, how could this ever make sense? And watching in context, you're like, this makes sense from the guy who made Midnight Run and is now trying to evolve to something more like emotional, more yeah. contemplative, but still has comedic bones in his body. Yeah, it was just like, I mean, it, on the one hand, it's like, okay, was Micho Black dated? Was it like, was it an old fashioned epic at a time when like Oscar plays were getting a little bit more modern? The indie revolution had taken over. Studios weren't doing well at the Oscars anymore. Movies were getting rougher. Right. But also there was like, I mean, not that this is some big success, but there was like Bagger Vance around the same time. Like there, this movie was not alone in it's like big sweeping magical no, realism. Titanic wins yeah. Best Picture mm -hmm. the same year this movie comes mm -hmm. out, which is kind of the last of those, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's the last of them to actually work with the Oscars on that level. Big, yeah. grand, broad, De emotional. Well, depends how you feel about like Lord of the Rings. Shakespeare and Love. I mean, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure. Shakespeare. But Shakespeare and Love is obviously funny. But that's the difference. Right. So much um, more of a comedy yeah, versus sure. this being so po faced. It's and this didn't have, you know, a, a monster, albeit right. good awards campaigner behind it, you know, like like Shakespeare and Love did. And Lord of the Rings, Gladiator, those movies are very old-fashioned, but they're the old they're epics. They're the film. huge production well, design. technical exactly. modernity. That's the thing. Right. Yeah. This is a movie about movie stars looking at each other. And like very expensive practical sets. And yes. Like, and and like saying things and, with yeah. deep meaning yeah. and just being like, we demand this be taken seriously as like Thomas Newman like fucking wilds it's out like, like animal. It's like someone melted yes, a does. James L. Brooks script on a radiator and it just yes. kind of like spread out a little and bit. It's like honey didn't. It's like the same yeah. kind of like like adages and like wisdoms so that you're like, what does that actually mean though? But it's just slowed down. It's just everything is yeah. And, and it's it's an unbearably earnest film in a way that I think can just make some people like absolutely choke. I will say, you know, I think this is my tenth time watching it. Uh, I have seen it so many times. I like the I I, I like a lot. It looks so good. I, I like mm -hmm. that they were spending all this money on Lubezki. it. I like that a lot of it was filmed in Rhode Island, where I, um, but where um, you live, right? And, and it's filmed the the final scene is filmed at your house. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a documentary about my dad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um. But I had never really been emotional with it before. Uh, watching it this morning, when For Forlani at the end says, because she's accepting that her dad's gone, I wish you could have met my father, which is an objectively insane thing to, met to say to someone you Correct. just met. Yep. Um, I burst into tears. I will say, and, and we're going to talk about this a lot, 
the final scene, the the second of two scenes between Brad Pitt and the Jamaican woman mm -hmm. made me cry this morning. And, and that should be impossible considering what Brad Pitt is doing in that mm -hmm. scene. He's doing Cameron Diaz's original voice from The Counselor. Yep. <laughs> and, and I just think the profundity of her performance and the directness of She's so the good. writing there, it, like, it just, it was one of those things where usually I do not cry at movies unless something is building for minutes upon minutes upon minutes. It really has to accumulate. Mm -hmm. There was some turn within two lines where suddenly I was misty. Thank you. Meet Joe Black. So, Griff, you'd never seen this film. Nope, not in full. I had also never seen it because I never had a week to devote to it. It's yes, just difficult is, is to clear out a week. I didn't. Re I thought you guys were both like like versed in this nope. movie. I knew that he got hit by the cars, and I knew that he said every ting was gonna be irie. Mm -hmm. uh, I was you know aware of that. Jeffrey I was Amber who says that. No, it was Sebastian the Crab. <laughs> you know what's the nice thing about <laughs> choosing to do Martin Bress before David Lynch ended up winning March Madness? What? Twin Peaks The Return will now only be the second longest thing we've covered on main feed. <laughs> It'll also be the second thing in which someone affects an insane accent well, for no reason. I don't want to spoil anything spoil for it. you. Yeah. Um, I knew this movie to be sort of legendarily kind of slow mm -hmm. and sleepwalking. Expensive. And sort of, right, lavish. And I knew it to be kind of the peak of like Brad Pitt as like pretty boy who kind of just stands there and like when he's making Fight Club, he's like, I can't do this anymore. Movie star in like, crisis mode. I have to stop. Right. Like this and Seven Years in Tibet. And there's, there's this, the fall, oh, right. you know, these kinds of movies where it's right. It's but specifically yes. the period between his seven, uh, 12 monkeys year and his Fight Club year. There's four years there where he cannot figure out what kind of movie star he wants it to be. It was grim. Yeah. 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 Um, and so Forky comes in, I'm, you know, I've got this on. Ask obviously. <laughs> says, what are you watching? Yeah, yeah. And she's like, why have you been in here all day watching one movie? And I'm like, well, uh, <laughs> your beard has gone gray. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Spilling down the why floor. are there spy why are you sitting in the couch but there's spider webs all around? <laughs> your child is like walking out the, out of the door in her uh, high school graduation. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. It's like the Mayo Chuck commercial. <laughs> it's fucking click in here. I think it's a mustard A and commercial. Go on. And I'm like, yeah, well, the deal with this movie is that it's, uh, you know, it's it's this like very slow moving kind of Tony drama. And then once in a while, it makes a choice so insane that you're like, what? What, <laughs> yeah. what is that? And yeah. That is what it is. Yes. But I think I got it. I think I got what I he was I going got, for. I, think I, got it. I don't think this is a movie I would tell people to watch. I don't think this movie is totally successful. I agree. With I understand both why this film did not bowl people over in 1998. Absolutely. But I get what he's going for. But I do think I look at certain prestige movies that were very popular with the Oscars. I mean, this is kind of to my Benjamin Button point. They were popular with the Oscars and box office successes in the 90s that you look at now and go, what the fuck was everyone thinking? I mean, I was a big fan of the movie at the time, but like, this is a better movie than American Beauty. It's a better movie than American Beauty. This is Beauty. a better movie than American Beauty. It's a Beauty. better movie than Scent of a Woman. American I was, Beauty might have more to say, but not in a good way. You know what I mean? American Beauty just kind of like is of its moment in a, a way that... There is a simplicity to this movie's focus and, and what he's sort of digging into. I also, I was thinking of another movie that comes out a year after this and is a huge hit and gets a bunch of Oscars and now everyone looks back on it and is like, what the fuck were we thinking? Green Mile? No. Yes. Yeah, Green Mile. Yeah. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, that movie could have just as easily been received at the time of its release the way this movie was. I'll say this though, Griffin. People have, have I have noticed, I have mentioned before that The Green Mile is ponderous and bad and kind of insane. And I, people have expressed surprise at that take because I think it did become something of a cable classic. Yeah. You know, like... Well, and Darabont it's just kind of that contract with TNT where he was like, <laughs> he will show all my movies. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's sort of lodged in people's brains. Like, whereas to me, the Green Mile is shitty. Like, you know, you look at that 1999 Oscar crop versus the 1999 movie crop. It's and you're like, the most how the hell did that sneak disparities. in? Right. Yeah. yeah. Versus 98 being a pretty good Oscar year. Uh, I, I genuinely yeah, wonder true. if this movie would have been received a bit more warmly in, in its day. Had I'm and like, I'm not really exaggerating. Had Brad Pitt had a different hairstyle. Possibly. I, I just want to restate. I'm not saying I'm surprised people didn't go for this. No, yeah, I'm, I'm not only either. surprised in perspective when I hold it up against other movies I am astonished people went for. It's yeah, it's not nearly as bad as its reputation suggests, which is always kind of a frustrating thing to, to but discover. But the hairstyle yeah. thing, Benjamin yeah. Button, 
the big scene where he comes back and it's the first turning point in the yeah. movie where they're going like aggressively de-aging him where he's crested yeah. the midpoint, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And now we have to get Brad Pitt young. And I think the key image that was like the money drop shot of the trailer was him walking into the dance studio mm -hmm. and he looks perfect, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And David Fincher said, the thing we aimed for was meet Joe Black. Yeah. As much as that's his hated movie, it's like this was the perfect snapshot of Brad Pitt at his peak beauty before he starts getting so uncomfortable with it that he's like, I need to fuck it up in some way in every movie. And if I'm not fucking up my look, I'm throwing off my energy. I refuse to be a Ken doll anymore. It was him at and peak. He, said he became it, a Kindle. Yeah, he became a Kindle. You can read it, him. It's him at yeah. peak pretty. Yes. And then some yes. would say that peak hot was Fight Club. Yeah. Right. But that's yeah. a huge shift that yeah. he stops so being delicate and he starts trying to. He, he, it's like, it's like when you, when I first saw DiCaprio in um, The Departed. And I was like, wait, he's got like scruff and looks kind of like he hasn't slept in two days. And I was like, this is a whole new thing, but I'm into it, you know? And that's kind of what Pitt was about to do after this. It's nowhere near as good as the two performances I'm about to cite. But I think this performance, in terms of the arc of the careers... Now I'm excited. <laughs> get, no, get excited. And the directors, that were, whatever, is very paired with DiCaprio and The Departed and Tom Cruise and Eyes Wide Shut. Where it's mm. like three guys who are like, I'm trying to level up. I'm trying to break out of my thing. I'm handing myself over to someone. And part of what's compelling about the performance is they they don't quite have control of what they're doing. Right. They're being used in a way. Part of the like energy of the performance is them struggling, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think Pitt's performance in this is fascinating because I think at times he is transcendently good. And I think at times he is like borderline inept. And I would basically say the times he is transcendently good is when he's playing inept. And when he's trying to play transcendence, he is inept. Yeah, I go with that. But there are moments sure. of such raw power in what he's doing that like he talks about, I was lost, I was stumbling, I was sad, I was going through personal things, my eye was off the ball. Every moment in this that works is because of that, is because of him not having a handle on this. And Brest kind of understanding the weird, like empty beauty of him. Yeah. That makes sense. I think Brest is the right is the answer to ever. He seems like he's just kind of giving himself over to him, and there's stuff that works better than other stuff. I I think my favorite part is when he um and you guys might not have noticed this at mm. all. But he does like a Jamaican accent at one point, right? And I just thought that was so good when he, he tells did you that. that everything's going to be Irish, right? right. Um, Can you watch that scene again? And you're like, just, my wife nothing is, like, that is being said. It happens twice. It happens twice. Yeah. Yeah, but you're like, this didn't need to happen because, like, they can communicate. Which he doesn't need to do this. Yeah, it's of not, course it's he, not like it, 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 there's already abstraction. He's in the body of another person. Yes. It's not like he's a walking skeleton, right? right? No. It's not like he's shaped. That would be interesting. Well, I yeah. thought about it. I thought about a lot of stuff. <laughs> but also, this <laughs> scene, the look, yeah. the scene makes yeah. more sense. And is less jarring, hypothetically, right? Just thought experiment here. If the woman doesn't speak English and, and everyone's stunned, that's like, oh my God, suddenly he's bilingual. Yes. He speaks to her no versus shit. speaking English of course. in it's a the patois. It's the first note. It's, it's the, the first, first note. note. It's the where I'm yeah. like, my first note is that the lady should be Chinese and he just speaks Chinese. Yeah. He right. speaks the Chinese language with, and that's it. And Martin and Brest is like... slang Martin pick any right. fucking language is that is in English. This is at the script. And if Martin Brest is like, I'm not changing that, I'm like, I will never make this movie. Never, ever, ever. I will never make it. That is my one note. <laughs> yes. Everything else we can talk about, yes. this will never be made. Your movie will be laughed out of theaters for a thousand years. They will invent something called YouTube. You don't know what it is yet. But that scene's going on there and everyone's going to watch it, my friend. Marty, I will let four additional cars hit Brad Pitt if you <laughs> yeah, change exactly. the language. You can fucking <laughs> do a Street Fighter chain attack. Yeah. He floats Absolutely. in the air for 10 can, minutes. It, we we, we can make care. it look like that scene is stuck on a loop and he's just bouncing back with, between cars. You can add a full yeah. hour to the runtime just <laughs> yeah. with the fucking yeah. car ping-ponging yeah. if you just change the language there. Nice. Or you have to have other scenes where he does something similar. Like he goes to order a pizza and he's like, yeah, two slices, you know, <laughs> like... You, it he has would be, to be better, right? If it was, <laughs> it wouldn't be good. But if it was like an Italian lady, and he was like, "Hey, don't worry about it, honey. Like, why are you breaking my balls? I'm death." But what you're, you guys are joking as underlining the bizarreness of him being like, like, why does it have to be that, Martin? I'm just gonna talk else. like her. <laughs> There's no language goal, and her daughter is gonna be like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> what a nice man. Yeah. Yeah. That said, that actress. 
She's wonderful. She's, it was like a big Lois theater. Kelly Miller. She's a legendary Jamaican name. Legend. Yes. Yeah. 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 Like a, a cultural and she like, really titan. delivers in those two scenes, especially the second one. She yeah. Yeah. destroyed me. Yeah. Destroyed yeah. me. And I'm like, this is the central tension of this movie. The most like absurd, wrongheaded thing is happening simultaneous to something that I find so pure and direct and thoughtful. Maybe the dossier yeah. can answer the question. All right, Martin Bresch. Let's I'm opening the dossier. What's your question? Just like, is he just, wh why? Just why? The, the, the question is why? I've read through the dossier and I hate to tell you that there is no answer for so that. So I guess the answer just has to be that he's like, I made Beverly Hills Cop a Midnight Run. Then I did Scent of Woman. They probably all thought that sounded stupid too and look what happened there. Yeah. So I'm right. This will work. He was bound to determine. I read an old interview with him in Premier Magazine. He was determined to prove once and for all that death is heterosexual. It's the greatest it the, shit on the earth. The great mission of his life. Then he Can't immediately and said, gay. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Death is even asked if he's gay in the yes. movie. And he says, no. No, hardcore. <laughs> no, bro. No. No, so I, that's on you guys. Not me. I think the answer, David, the movies you just listed all kind of have a scene like this, right? Beverly Hills Cop and Midnight Run and Scent of a Woman all have a scene where someone enters a room and affects a weird persona yeah, to sure. like code switch into to pass with the other people mm -hmm. for whatever ultimate game. This is what I'm saying about this movie being a straighter line between comedy breast and prestige breast than Scent of a Woman, where you can see him being like, well, the point is the heightened comedy of it. The point is how bizarre this is. But you watch it and it's really kind of hard. I think for a just lot of people. Else. Yes. Anything I, else would work. Yeah. No, right? Yeah. Even if it was, he was just like, look, I know death is a spicy meatball, but you're going to eat it up and whatever. David knocked five things off his I table. Did. Martin well, Bresch. The thing it's nominally based on, mm -hmm. Death Takes a Holiday, which is a play and then a, a movie, is like it has little funny details where like a guy jumps off the Eiffel Tower and can't die because death is not working. And yes, like yes. plants come back to life. And it's like, so there's whimsy to there's it. There's much more and there's none comedy of based around that. That yeah, movie's also 75 minutes long. And if there was whimsy in, 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 in Meet Joe Black, the 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 patois yes. would be like, I'd be like, okay, well, this is just part of this weird no, little right. world. This is like but, the one scene in the movie where he has like Bruce Almighty-esque <laughs> powers, which makes it sound out more yeah. where it's like he's doing a weird thing he has Evan Almighty out of powers nowhere. the whole time. The whole time. <laughs> but Bruce, just yes. this once. Martin Brest uh, makes big movies in the 1980s. In the 1990s, he starts making remakes of movies that he saw at the American Film Institute in the 1970s. Sent based on woman. Italian comedies. Right. It's based on an Italian comedy mm -hmm. called Profumo di Donna. Mm -hmm. Meet Joe Black is based on the 1934 film Death Takes a Holiday, which indeed is based on an Italian Thank play you. and a Broadway uh, adaptation of it. He... I think was initially, I think Hot Tomorrow's is a little inspired by all this, Absolutely. right? All the way back when, right? Death is like his central concern. But obviously, it's very important to going in style as well. As he says, like death, mortality. You know, I saw that film when I was in my early 20s. Uh, I just, he says he turned on the TV and was sitting on a bed and he put one pant leg through my pants and the movie was on and he watched the entire movie before he put the other leg in his pants. Now, only 75 minutes. So not not as big an ask, but still. Uh, and he then spent 20 years trying to make this movie, like trying to figure out how to do this. We've talked about in the past, like uh, we've joked about it, but like movies as a child that I was like, how dare you screen this for children? It has death in it. This is not funny. 100%. Right? My version of Flutter. the like Aukerman, uh, well, the Casper movie more so, but the Aukerman Joker bit, like you guys are laughing at this right. kind of thing. I can totally see the way he talks about his obsession with death as a child that feels very paired to my own experience. I can totally see Martin Bress watching the original film at 20 and being like, this movie is unspeakably sad and dark. This is a light comedy, but if you're actually digging into the text of what it is, it's fascinating. And like it just having this permanent hold on him. It's a it's a very solid comedy. It's sure. a, what's his name? It. Michael Leeson. Mm -hmm who directed a lot of Preston Sturgis scripts before he started directing his own films, Easy Living and Remember the Night, which are both solid Easy as living, hell. Very fun. Yeah. Have you ever seen Remember the Night? Never. The fucking uh, McMurray and uh, Stanwyck. Good guys. Good shit. We like them. Yeah. What are they doing? Remembering the Night sounds boring. Oh, is that is that the one where they go? Is it like kind of a road movie? Yeah, and you know what? They, it's actually they, a little bit Midnight Run where he's they a steal lawyer. A bracelet, and then they she, have to go on yes, the run. That's, he I've steals a bracelet. Good. He's a lawyer representing she's her. Like miraculously good in that. She's going to be held yeah. over Barbara for Christmas. Stanley, he spends the night with her. Yes, that's but right. she's and kind of the Groden. It's it's Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good movie. I've seen that. Meet Joe Black. Meet Joe Black. Uh, 
Kevin Wade is the first screenwriter that uh, Brest works with. This film has four credited screenwriters. Uh, Kev- Kevin Wade had written Working Girl. He wrote four drafts over the years. Then uh, Jeff Reno and Rob Osborne are a team uh, mm-hmm. who would, were from Moonlighting. Mm-hmm. They take some swings at it, but then he brings in Bo Goldman, who wrote Scent of a Woman, poorly, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I agree. Um, his worst script. <laughs> yes, but, yeah. uh, but obviously a guy with credits. A tremendous writer at his best. Yeah. And uh, Brest says, look, death is a blank. It's non-existent. So we realize the movie is about life and what life is because it's about to be taken away. What's the major component of life? Love. So what's love, really? There's father-daughter love. There's romantic love. So that will be the movie. It'll be about those two things. It is the way that everyone talks about uh, the Benjamin Button development, where like 15, 20 years of everyone trying to make this movie, no one can figure out a script. And then Eric Roth writes this thing and everyone in Hollywood responds with like, this guy has tapped the raw nerve and this is now fast-tracked as hell. It just sounds like Bo Goldman comes on and everyone who reads this, let me note, 130-page script, Mm -mm. a fleeter version of this movie was like, yeah, this is, I get what Bress wants to do here. I see the appeal. Death Takes a Holiday, just to note, is not about that stuff. Death takes a holiday, holiday, right? It's just like, death is like, why does nobody like me? I'm going to pretend to be like a fancy man and then is horny and falls out, falls for someone, right? And and then she decides to go with him. Right. That's the big, the ending is flipped. The ending is, right. But she she knows what she's in for. Uh, Yeah, I mean, there's similarly, he's there ostensibly to claim a man who he wants to use. uh, His fanciness. uh, Have him serve as a tour guide. Yeah. The difference is that it's the daughter of his rival rather than being his daughter who he falls for. And the whole movie is in Jamaican Patois. Yes. Right. Of course. And of, yeah. But yeah. it is, of course, still about a proposed merger between two businesses. And it spends yeah. lots of time on that. But as Richard said, <laughs> it's much more leaning into the comedy of what happens yeah. in a week where There's death no doesn't death. exist. Uh-oh. Right. I think this movie yeah. doesn't... Not addressed. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't want to do it in this way where you're like, at the end, you're like, Okay, but wait a second. Where was the coffee shop guy this whole time? The sister he was on the phone with did like did she go to a morgue? Or, like what? Ha- like what happened? It's been d- many days, if not weeks. Um, and I kind of do wish I like this movie a lot, but like I do wish that it just gestured toward that stuff a little Richard, bit. Where is the time in this <laughs> movie? Oh, well, right. In a movie this yeah. stuffed, yeah. That's the thing where you're like, oh, it's three hours long. You're like, yeah, but it's got like four characters. So I mean, of course it's long. You were um, joking about how much uh, a business merger uh, sales shit there is in this movie. Do you know that, unlike we've talked about other films recently, uh, where they'll put all the deleted scenes in to be able to fill a longer block on on movie channels, this movie Universal cut down to two hours, yes. and they did that by taking out all the business shit. And Brest uh, disowned it. it. Alan Smithy, that shit hard. He did. But it would be a fascinating alternate version to watch. I would be fascinated. I'm surprised this movie wasn't at Fox because it is in some ways like, don't worry, Rupert Murdoch, you're going to heaven. It feels so <laughs> foxy. <laughs> like, it's just like, yes, no, be- yes, be- yes. You know, wonderful media tycoon right. who's like, lived a beautiful life. You're actually life. a very good man, yeah, Richard. Don't, Rupert. don't worry. Yeah. I think that he's, the, the unseen tycoon is Murdoch. That's how I take it. That he's like, I won't guy. merge with that guy. Sure. Oh, he I thinks he can saying. run yeah. the world so through a communications <laughs> firm. Yeah. <laughs> or <George> Buffett, <laughs> yeah. sort of. Right, like he, I mean, right. It's not like, I mean, we don't delve into like what a noble life Anthony Hopkins had to yeah. earn this massive largesse running a com right. firm or whatever he does. But like the way he talks about this person we never see. Yeah. Does kind of make him sound kind of murdoch or Maxwell or whatever. Sure. Uh, JJ, uh, this was not in J.J.'s dossier, and I'm always hesitant to cite something that is unsourced, but I saw a number of places on the internet, I, I, so I qualified this, I tagged this hard as rumor and legend, say that when Bo Goldman was writing the script in his mind, he was designing the role for Gene Hackman. Sure, that, I mean, oh, that's, that's interesting. a different movie, but he's right there. I bring it up for this reason. It is interesting that when this movie starts out, Anthony Hopkins is pretty soulful and in touch. Perhaps, you know, like once he knows death is knocking on the door, he's like, spend more time with my family. Reprioritize a little bit. But the scene in the helicopter with Claire Forlani, where he's like, actually live a life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
comes before death has like that's the point with he's already ear. right he's, he's already, already got some... there yeah hackman you could see doing a version of this movie that's maybe a little more traditionally cathartic for the audience where he starts out as a little bit more of a scrooge figure and joe black lightens him up yeah yeah i mean i think that part of I, the, this time watching it i was think, thinking about certain narrative choices like it's interesting that the wife has already died before the movie starts which I guess is supposed to soften him and bond him to his children. But I just kind of wonder, like, it it makes it makes it makes it a little grimmer that these people are about to be orphaned. But also, like, I don't know, I think there would have been an interesting tension if he was the first of that generation in the family to die because, like, I don't know, it's like something's crumbling. Like, you know, we're, oh, it's, there, it's, there, it's Claire Forlani and Marcia Gay Harden's first experience of loss. But that it's this that it's going to be the second one. I think sort of softens the impact of the movie in a weird way, even though it is a tragedy. I don't know. I, I'm the, not really the explaining sort what of I mean. Maintain. I know. I totally get what you're saying. The maintained pathos is like kind of the Hopkins superpower, where if you're hiring him, that's what you want out of this movie. Like the thing I find the opening of this film of just him sort of tossing and turning in bed, grabbing his chest. And then just in voiceover, Hopkins' own voice whispering yes, as like Thomas Newman is like creating a fire on those <laughs> I don't know fucking what you're strings. About. The Thomas Newman score is very subtle. You can barely hear it. There's mm -hmm. something immediately kind of grabbing about my it. My ear horn. Right? Of like this movie is starting from like a very palpable sadness and loneliness. Sadness and and kind of whispery, I mean, literally like mystery. I, I just think it's like to, to, to plop down in the fall of 1998 at your local multiplex and like this is what greets you. Um, we don't really have that much anymore. And I think that's one of the reasons I appreciate this movie as much as I do, because it's like a huge swing that isn't afraid to immediately announce itself as something sort of strange and yeah. metaphysical. Yes. Death takes a holiday. Uh, as Griffin noted, the scripts, according to everyone who worked on them, were more like 135 pages. They don't know how this movie ended up three hours, except that, uh, as Wade puts it, this must have been on Marty's mind for a long time. And when you own it in your own way, you want it all in there. So, coming from Marty. Uh, Martin there, Bress there's a quote later in the dossier where Martin Bress says, when people complain about the length of this movie, I think they're really complaining about the pacing, and I own that. He's right. He's right. The it, issue with this film is the pacing. That's the thing I don't understand about the, oh, they made the two-hour cut where they took out the business stuff. Just take out all the pauses. David, <laughs> You could pull a lot of this out. Ben David just, Grabinski, friend of the podcast, texted that exact thing to me like, today. Just take a vacuum cleaner and ben go just, like, yeah. It is, you know, it is crazy to watch. You this could cut movie. 45 minutes out from pauses. Yeah, oh, easily. It's so wild to watch this movie. And uh, Joe says to Bill... All right, we'll do it tomorrow after the party. And then it cuts to, okay, it's day of the party, y'all. And then you look at the time thing for you're like, oh left. my God, there's like 15 minutes left right. of this movie. Like, and 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 there's so many instances in that 15 minutes where you could just tighten it, not lose a single bit of plot. But compare it to Scent of a Woman, which I would argue feels 18 hours longer than mm -hmm. this, has scenes that are so fucking repetitive. And the 30-minute fucking kangaroo court at the end that is beyond unnecessary. On paper, if you just look at a scene-by-scene -scene synopsis of this movie, you're like, doesn't feel padded. It's like a two-hour movie. That looks normal. Yeah. There's no mm -hmm. scene here that sounds stupid on paper. I, I'm i going to mention a few other things when we get to them. But right, I think, there, I think there's a point to the pace and the slowness of the movie. But I do think it's maybe a little much. It's a, a little, little self-defeating. But it does successfully conjure a very specific tone and that's feeling. It. That's yeah. It. Mm -hmm. Which I understand. But, you know, you're harming a lot of things by doing that. Brad Pitt, Brass sees him in California. A terrible movie. Yeah. And it, it, an insane movie to cast him in this off of. Decides he's yeah. terrifying in it. And says, I love the idea of this, like, good-looking young man that's going to kill this older man, like, you know, investing the, you know, the, we get it. You know, it's a, it's a, oh, death's this hot young guy. Who's straight, by the way. <laughs> As an arrow. Brest calls him an old-fashioned gentleman, uh, something, someone out of another era. Tells a story about meeting with him, and they were in a hotel room, and he kept opening the window to smoke out the window. Right. He like Brest is like, I was smoking a cigar and fucking stinking up the room, but Brad was still opening the window to blow his smoke outside. 
And Brass said, you don't have to worry about it. And Brad was like, that's all right. And he liked the sort of old dignity of that. What I find surprising about California being the thing he cites is it doesn't feel like scary is the main thing this movie is looking for out of him. When he is scary, it is because he feels a little blank. And I think Brad Pitt basically had two modes at this time, one of which was, let me go as crazy as possible. Let me torture myself, fucking bloody up my face, which he was very good at. And then what he struggled with was just kind of holding the center. And that's when he kind of becomes like blank, beautiful baby. And sometimes the movie around him, like Legends of the Fall, can kind of use it properly. And other times you're like, this guy is fucking checked out. And the blankness here is an asset. I would say. Yeah. But I think audiences thought he was absolutely out. right. Well, it, it's let's say, let me put it this way. It's an asset now. I get it. Yes. Yeah. In yeah, the future, yeah. when we've seen Brad Pitt come into his own as a performer versus in 1998, I can imagine people are sitting there going, is there nothing there? Are we all totally reading something into this guy? Which is also kind of what the movie's doing. Like Claire Forlani's falling in love with a baby who won't stop eating out of a jar and doesn't understand <laughs> yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. It's implied he's wearing a diaper too, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, He doesn't know what it's doing. He comes so fast. <laughs> Hit correct. That, that's sexy. Was my letterbox yeah. log was death comes prematurely. <laughs> Pitt correctly, in a way, says the film sounds on paper like a Whoopi Goldberg concept movie. Uh, but then he says, I read the script and it's actually quite beautiful. You know, Marty wanted this young guy completely unaffected and very straightforward. So straight. Emphasis on straight. So mm-hmm. straight. Um, he does his job. Like, like this is a guy who does his job, right? And this is Pitt during a mad era of his career, as he says, where it's like, it, I, I can only imagine what it was like. Like to, to pick a project must have been a daunting thing. You were, you're wanted for everything, right? Like you, Brad Pitt in 1998 could probably basically be in any movie he wanted, barring like five to six auteur projects maybe where the director's like, no, 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 I wrote this for De Niro or whatever, right? Like, that's it. In his age class, like, is he the number two choice behind Cruise? I think so. And there's a giant gulf between the two, but but Cruise Cruise is is doing his own special thing anyway, right? And Pitt was so pretty and so desired. I mean, obviously Cruise was too, but but Pitt had this specific thing that I think a lot of straight men rolled their eyes at. And, but he needed straight men to want to see the things he was in and, and cast him in things and, and direct him in things. And so it, it's such a delicate dance that he had to do in this period of time. And he picked a lot of, maybe he picked wrong a few times, but like, I just, I don't envy the sort of like, if I make one false move, I'm going to, I mean, he did for this win a Razzie award. It's, you know, that doesn't mean anything, but like, it's just that it was such he a should have made edge. one false move. Good movie. Yeah. So... Later, he says this film was a bit of a mistake in terms of the project he picked. He says, I got lost in the wilderness of fame a bit. There's all these opportunities you're supposed to be taking, and I got really discombobulated. Uh, Then he says, like you've mentioned this, that was the pinnacle of my loss of direction and compass. Uh, I dogged it. I muffed it. I shouldn't have been there in the first place. I should have been decompressing. I didn't crack the piece. Someone could have been better in it. He's like Hopkins fucking nailed it. Like he he has full praise for that. And they were already very close from I, Legends of the Fall. Right, I think exactly. they had they a got very along. good relationship. Yeah. And obviously, as we've mentioned on our Fight Club episode, Fight Club is his big response to like him getting slaughtered for this movie, basically. Yes. The the term he uses now when he talks about his struggle and like he sort of gets back on track after this. And then Troy was kind of a contractual obligation movie. That's the last time he's sort of playing a blank. And then he really doubles down on like, I'm making my choices very specifically after that. The term he always uses, what I think about a lot is, I needed to find directors who wouldn't put me at the center of the frame. Sure, right. Who wouldn't just make the lazy choice. Um, Hopkins also loves the script. That's why he signs on. Loves Pitt. Likes working with those young guys. Claims he wrote him a fan letter after seven among 12 monkeys. I'm sure that was a normal letter. Hopkins, have you ever read any of his fan letters? I've, I know he, he writes, writes a them. ton of them. He's a sweetie pie. And people will post of. them. And they're very, they're very effusive. Well, it's funny to send a fan letter to him when he'd already worked with him. Yes. Right. But and, maybe and, that's, but it's that, that kind of thing. He, he of does like, that like, Brad. I want you to yeah. know I see what you're doing. Love, Uncle Anthony. <laughs> um, and for Lonnie... 
I don't really know. I mean, she's a thing at this point, I, I, right? I, 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 I want to like, zoom into Forlani for a second. Yeah. But before that, I just want to like fully. There's not much on Forlani in the dossier. We can talk about like what she'd been doing. I want to talk about her. But like Pitt obviously breaks out 91, Thelma Louise, Johnny Swade, right? Mm-hmm. Then like 92, Cool World, River Runs Through It. 93, California, True Romance. That's him trying to rough it up a bit. 94, Interview with a Vampire, Legends of the Fall. It's like women are 1,000% on board with this guy. And he's had two hits in one year. Basements across the nation flooded. Right. <laughs> 95, 7, 12 Monkeys. As we said, it's like now guys like him. Now he's worked with two weirdo auteurs. 96 Sleepers. I'd say that's almost net neutral for him other than like putting him in a class of guys, framing yeah. him on a tier, right? He was also cushioned by an ensemble. Like, he wasn't exactly. the lead, lead of that movie. And then 97 Devil's Own, Seven Years in Tibet. You're like, Whoa. this is in theory what he should be doing, and he's really failing at this. And then 98 Meet Joe Black. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the like Devil's Own and Seven Years in Tibet are, are interesting. Well, because in, in Devil's Own, he's trying an accent. That goes disastrously. And that production was a disaster. Um, and then Seven Years in Tibet is just this earnest kind of dull movie. But the what the thing that people most talked about was how blonde his hair was. Like, it was just like, oh, it's a little too blonde now. You know, like and that he, was no one cared about the rest of the movie. He looks just a little too perfect. Yeah. Yeah. To be framed in a movie in any way. But look at how perfect but this guy looks. But at the looks. time, and not to be cynical about it, but at the time, like the Free Tibet movement was so oh, big. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and um, it, and this, I remember reading about this in like Entertainment Weekly because I was like about 14, 15 when this was all happening and being like, oh, seven years in Tibet, like that's because that's his like serious actor. It's a period piece. It's kind of a somewhat esoteric um, true story. You know, um, it's one for him is how that movie was treated. But you watch it now and you're like, no, this was a big Hollywood. Like it was not like some little indie he went to go make. Claire Falani, Mallrats is like her first major American studio film. Uh, yes, yeah, so and Mallrats is basically where she merges. She's British. Uh, well, you you have to remember that she was in Police Academy Mission to Moscow. I always forget the Police Academies. Um, you are right. Yes, you would. But she apparently played a Russian in that. Okay. Uh, I guess they go on a mission to Moscow. You're I haven't seen the film. Mallrat, she does The Rock and yes. Bascot, which are both small parts, but in movies that get good notices, and she's good in both of them. Yeah, she she pops in Basquiat, I would say, and in The Rock too. But obviously, The Rock is like big lab movie. I you just know. Yeah. you know, I'm it's gonna, like you're just kind of like oh, like there's clear for I'm gonna get ahead of this. 1999 Mystery Men, unsurprisingly, I would say a very formative crush for me. Sure, I hear you. Yeah. For just the way she relates to the unbearably neurotic, insecure, angry Ben Stiller in that right. movie, I was right. like, oh, this is what an adult relationship looks like. <laughs> I and say, she's the most striking woman. I've never been a fan of hers. And I don't particularly like her in any movie. Interesting. I'm sorry to say it about Claire Forlani. She's fine. I just don't like her that much. I've always liked her. She's fine. I don't hate I her. I always was a little surprised by how, like, completely her career derailed after this. In a lot of ways, it feels like she got hit she, harder by this movie than did. anyone else. Oh, Universal yeah. has her clearly in Mystery Men already. She's yeah, already yeah, yeah. off for that then, but she gets one. She gets an Amy Heckerling movie, mm -hmm. Boys and Girls. That's Amy Heckerling, right? It's not. It's, it's Robert Isco. Oh, no. It's, no. Um, what am I thinking Robert, of? Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking, sorry. I'm thinking of Loser. Yes. Isco. The other Jason Biggs movie. I thought it's Donald Petrie. Am I wrong about this? You're wrong. Boys and Girls is okay. a film directed by Robert Isco. And she does Antitrust. The Tim yeah. Robbins is Evil Bill but, Gates movie. Boys and Girls God. is so bad. What everyone yes. wanted that, then. That, like, and then Antitrust, she's just kind of like the the late, the, the girl in it. You know, she just, well, it's not no, like No, there's a, two. The problem is there's, it's her and Rachel Lee Cook. Right. Two girls who aren't quite hitting with kind of short hair. You know what I mean? Surprisingly, like, my two big two greatest. Girls. Yeah. But, but, I, uh, but I think I think you're right that Forlani, like this wiped her out. I can think. I tell you why it wiped yeah. her out? Why? She's not that good in it. Here, uh, here's, And like the movie, there's a lot of weight on her in this movie. Yes. She's fine. Yeah. It's not, it's not like Sofia Coppola and Godfather where you're like, oh my God, get her off the screen. This is, a, this is, I'm hard to watch. Like, I feel like she's suffering. But there's a little bit of a Julia Ormond she in Sabrina thing yeah. where it's Ooh, like, yeah. you're framing this movie around someone being undeniable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And beyond just acting ability, it's just like, this movie is asking you to just accept fucking it factor off the charts, holding the screen yeah. with like wizened movie stars. I think... The central issue with this movie, which is maybe an insane thing to say for a film that is three hours long and has four of the most insane scenes ever committed to film. I think the central issue with this movie 
the first, let's say, 15, 10, 15 minutes where it's her relating to Anthony Hopkins. Yes. I'm like, this is what I liked so much about Claire Falani. Mm -hmm. I find her really striking in all the scenes with Hopkins. I like their dynamic a lot. I think the scene where she meets real Brad Pitt, pro bono lawyer in the diner, absolutely does not work. Yeah. I think a lot of it's Pitt's failing of this is the exact thing he's not good at doing at this time. Mm. Yeah. He becomes so much better when he has to play a blank rather right. than a quote unquote, a real guy. Yeah. Uh, I just think the chemistry is not there with them. No. And anytime the movie focuses on the two of them together, it doesn't work. I agree with you. She's not working, but I think it's a mutual. Both of them aren't working and they're absolutely not in sync. I do think she nails the final scenes with him. Yeah, she's nice in those scenes. I, well, she's so good at being half crying and, you know, sort yeah, of that's whatever. It, right. She can yeah. just kind of sort of stare with her eyes. Yeah. But, but I find the romance scenes, the seduction scenes in this borderline, like, too cringy to watch. Agreed. Like, it's rough. Agreed. The only one that beats it for me is the sex scene because it's so bizarre and owning its bizarreness that it kind of goes all the way back around. Yeah. Anytime they're, like, talking to each other and flirting... The movie does kind of make me want to rip my flesh off. <laughs> it's it's rough. It's yeah. And part of it is I Pitt says this. I don't remember if this quote's in the dossier or not, but that his take that he felt like he didn't totally grab was to do something a little being there. And that's kind mm. of the balancing act this movie is trying to play of like it, it's the poor things thing as well, right? Like everyone being very taken by this charismatic beautiful movie star that they don't notice that they're basically an idiot. <laughs> Right, right. Right. And like, I, I don't buy that she's falling for him in spite of how weird he's acting. I don't like what you're saying right now. I'm sorry, Ben. But I think her last three scenes, I think her goodbye to Hopkins, I think the scene where she puts together that he's death is is really well done. And I think it's also good writing in that they don't write it. That, that I like. And I like the way the scene is constructed. Yeah. 10 yes. minutes of two close-ups which oh, it's more than that, buddy. Is <laughs> so insane on paper. And like Bress says for him, that's his proudest moment in his entire filmmaking mm -hmm. career. And I totally get it. I think it's insane that that's his opinion yeah. because he has better work. Yeah. But I understand what he's saying. Yeah. I remember, I think the first time I saw this movie, it was would have been fall of my sophomore year of high school. I believe I cut school to see it, which was a common practice of mine. Um, I have a long Got list hit by of four movies. cars I, oh, on the uh, way to the theater. Yep. I cut school to see a movie once and I couldn't get in. So I had to go see Flubber for the second time because <laughs> I was already at the movie theater. Do you remember what you Flubber were trying to see again? instead at R rated? Uh, when was Flubber? 98 as well. 97. 97. Oh, I was, believe I was trying to see Boogie Nights. If they, if they were out at the same time, I think they were both fall. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, Flubber is, of course, Thanksgiving 97, yeah. baby. Um, anyway, but I, I, I feel like because I, you know, had read about this movie in like fall movie preview and various other things in EW. And one of the things that excited me about it was because I'd seen Mallrats and I was like, okay, I'm now at the age where I'm going to watch my movie stars emerge. And Claire Forlani was going to be, she got the lead in the big Brad Pitt movie. And even at the time- You were watching the pipeline. Exactly. It was yeah. exciting. I was like, I'm, I was here on, you know, on the ground floor. On the ground floor. floor, right. And then even watching the movie the first time, by the end, I was like, oh, it didn't really work She's for me. not nabbing it. It just didn't, it, no. something doesn't connect. No one walks out of that movie being like, I want tons of Claire Forlani. Yeah. They might walk out Maybe being she, like, she was good. But, but see, yeah. like me skipping this and going straight to Mystery Man, I was like, why is everyone not hiring this person? <laughs> well, obviously, right. we all saw Mystery Man. That right. was about yeah. superheroes. Who were crazy in the Let, bowling ball? Let's also call out the fascinating reality of her being married to Do Gray Scott for like the last 25 years to people who kind of have identical career tracks. Yeah. Where that's it's true. like end of the 90s, the studio was like, we're thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, big time. Yeah. And, oh, God. And then 25 years of like, oh, right. And they just will pop up and stuff occasionally. Sure. Yeah. They're both still working. I remember her being in television ads as the spokesperson for some scotch like 10 years ago. She's still around. She she did some TV show recently. Mm, what was it? Mm, maybe not, actually. It's actually been a while since Hawaii 5 which it seems like. She was on Hawaii oh, she, 5 she was she was not like full time, but she was in a Peacock original called Departure, which is about I think like air traffic controllers. <laughs> okay, look, what's important is that on set. This may stun you to hear if you've listened to any episodes <laughs> of our Martin Breast series. Uh -huh. But uh, he was a bit of a perfectionist and mm -hmm. asked for a lot of takes. What made you laugh though? What made you laugh? 
the, the wind up. Oh, okay, no one okay, okay. I thought you had a funny guy. No, 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 no. Yeah, uh, I this mean, movie, the budget ballooned to ninety million dollars. It went several months over schedule. This movie looks expensive, and it has movie stars in it, but it, I don't think it should have cost that much money. You get two fancy locations. Yeah, your work is done. Yeah, but it's time. David. No, I'm aware. I'm aware of why. Believe me, I know why the budget ballooned. I'm just saying, like, you could make this cheaply. Of course you could. <sighs> of course well, you could. As much yeah. as the Cheaper. estate itself, I'm sure, was very expensive, and it's the primary location of this movie. And we've talked about like making movies about rich people is expensive to replicate their lifestyle. It is the the primary like 60, 70 percent of the movie set in the one fucking grounds. The Matrix yeah. cost what. 65, 63 million dollars a year later? But that's, the Matrix. All, that's all in the Matrix. It was just on computer uh, statements. So, right. There was just everything in the Matrix that cost money is just yeah. someone going. Yeah, boop, boop, boop. But also, yeah. why why did how did you know cost 120 million dollars? Because the guy wouldn't call cut. It's all on the screen. Who are you talking those about? Those real Rothkos, you think? <laughs> <laughs> they might have been. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> they bought them for the movie. Uh, my dad was almost in the party scene. Uh, really? Well, he could have been. He well, wasn't was at your house. I mean, as we established. No, we were in Rhode Island where we spent summers and my dad was reading the, the Providence Journal and they had like a little ad in the paper that was like, do you, do you own a tuxedo? Are you a man over 50? Wow. Would, do you live in, near, in the Newport, Rhode Island area? Come in. And my sister and I were like, you could be in a Brad Pitt movie. And he had a tuxedo because he was singing in a chorus thing or whatever. Sure. And we were like, you should do it. And he almost went. And then he kind of the last minute decided not to do it. And I forever... Well, he would have been at the not. mercy of Martin Brest being like, take oh, 82. We, we, yeah, would have, we would never say, would have seen him again. You would, exactly. <laughs> that would have been it. I would have seen him walking over a bridge with Brad Pitt right. and, now, and he's gone. Everyone back uh, to Mark's. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, there's like 400 people in this scene. Yep, everybody, everybody please. Right. You're like, why did this movie cost $90 million? You're like, if the guys could do 50 takes of it, that takes four years. Yeah, I mean- With these scenes playing out at the pace they're playing out? And every take requires a 20-minute fireworks sequence. <laughs> yeah. As as Pitt says, I would hate to go shopping with the guy. Funny line. Pitt's always got a funny line. He's got something that's so fine-tuned. He's like a conductor directing an orchestra. He brings up the strings, holds them, then cuts them off like that. And then in comes the bass drum. He's so precise with the tuning. He's a maestro. But I do think that's, you know... It's tough. This movie does feel symphonic. Absolutely. And that's why the slow listen, slowness makes sense on paper of yes. like, right, I'm building a mood very, very, very carefully. And it's consistent. And the emotions are going to come up. Now, the only thing I'll say that is disrupting that is Thomas Newman going like, burr, 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 the whole time, because that's what Thomas Newman fucking does. I feel does. like you're a little allergic to Newman, I, and I'm an easy, easy. lay for oh, him. I, I like Griffin, Newman's, same. I like yeah. Newman's yeah. scores. It just kind of gets me every time, even when I think he's doing the shittiest version of it. I like Newman's scores on the phone. He overwhelms movies sometimes. But I think especially in this, I don't like when the score gets into the like um, percussion, like whatever, the, the brassy sort of mm -hmm. like yeah. sound, you know? And that's like, like that's Nemo about to show up. That's too much. But I like everything else. And but like to the to the specificity of what Brest is doing toward the end when they're having their third goodbye, basically, between Brad and, and or Bill and, and um Joe. Uh and and Hopkins says something like, It's hard to leave, isn't it? And Brad Pitt says yes. And Hopkins goes like, Oh, well, uh, well that's life. Uh, what can I say? And as he says that, a firework burst of light is reflected on his face. And the score kicks in and it's like, that is so carefully calibrated to exactly that head move motion, exactly that line. Like, you know, it's, it's like, that's a lot of detail that like seems like, oh, that's easy. But like a lot of directors do not think. And that's like, like that. take 50. Yeah. That is, yeah. that is like. Where he figured it out, you know, it was right. like, I want it to be exactly here. Right. And Hopkins has talked about consummate pro is like, I, I'm like a three take guy. Yes. You give me three takes, I'll give you three really good options with a lot of variety yeah. in them. You're going to get three perfectly crafted different approaches to the piece you're asking me to do. Give or take, I'll maybe throw you two more if I'm in a good right, mood. Right. He's just like, you're not getting anything different out of me on take 35. This is Hopkins in 2022. So mm -hmm. he hasn't let go yes. of this. He's not saying this recently. No. Yeah. He is saying it recently. Not, He's not right, saying, saying it, it recently time. to now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Monty Brest, the director, lovely man. He'd be do take after take after take. I never knew why. I said to him one day, I don't have much longer to live. <laughs> Can we finish this? And in fact, he did. And in fact, that's in the fact, thing. In fact, he did. In fact, he did. But When um, they say early on, this is his 65th birthday, I was like, is he playing young in this? I yeah, realized he's 62. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah. There's just that weirdness of Hopkins being a guy who basically didn't become a movie star until he was in his mid-40s. 
where you're like, he only kind of exists as an old man. Even when he was 45, he played. He's, That's why he it read was tough older. to build a movie star career for the guy after he yeah. won the Oscar. But I mean, like Hopkins, like making this movie and being like, I'm old and been being like, oh, don't worry. In 22 years, you're going to win another Oscar. For, being <laughs> for playing so an old guy. fucking yeah. old. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and Lois uh, uh, Miller, the, the Jamaican woman in mm-hmm. the hospital, uh, only died in 2020. At the yeah, age lived of 102. 102. Yeah. So, yes. death, uh, you know, took another holiday for both of these people, I think. Uh, that's true. And as you say, Griff, he does think the scene where death reveals who he is to Susan, the most accomplished he's ever been involved with breast, thinks this. It's what you said, that they um, you know, say just, it without saying he's it. He's like, that it's can I do faces. this with everything tied behind my back? Exposition, visual effects. It's not like lightning will crackle out of this guy or anything like that. And, like, then, and then it's echoed when she accepts that her father is dead and says the line, you know, um, I wish you could have met my dad. It's like, that's a, such a a good way of not being like, my dad's dead. I mean, it is funny to think that there's a crumpled body across the bridge, bridge but like, yes. you know, that they're going to have to deal with. But um yeah, I think that that is really well done. And I agree with what you're saying, David, that even if you don't like her, this is specifically the kind of thing that Claire Forlani was good at, is the sort of like laughing through tears, mm-hmm. sort of like half wry, kind of like, I can't believe I'm showing my emotions. This is embarrassing kind of thing. Um, there's the quote in the dossier about the the principle of plating in cuisine. Correct. Can um, you read that? I can. Brad, this is Brad Pitt again. Um, talking about nouveau cuisine. No, no, sorry, I'm sorry. This is breast. Yeah, talk. I yeah sorry, I was sorry. I, 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 he says breast. I read, Brad, I read Brad. You know how in nouveau cuisine they'd serve one piece of something on a very bare plate, and then that one piece of whatever better be a very high quality because it wasn't smothered in something. The nature of this film is there's not a lot of technique that covers the actors. It's just them working. Funny considering that scent of a woman is like drowned in fucking Bernier's sauce, that's basically. That's exactly why I not only think right. this film is infinitely better, but is a much stronger showcase of Breast as a filmmaker. Even if you think this movie is bad, I Boring. think it's... Right. I think it's hard to argue that the person making it isn't like a real film artist versus scent of a woman. I'd be like, and this was made by... Yeah. A domestic terrorist on the it's run from the law. That's yes. the frustration right. about the way this the, this movie was treated at the time and has been since is that like it's treated as like it's treated like it's Bagger Vance where it's just kind of like a, I mean, which you know there's style in that movie sure but like where it's just oh it's just toss off Hollywood product and it's like well no if you actually watch the movie this was like very carefully made this is none of this is like accidental or or they didn't luck into any of this they didn't stumble into it you know um and I and I just think that like. That, that it gets kind of derided for its, you know, corniness or its slowness or whatever is, okay, fair. All but valid. Like, but, like, we don't have shit like this anymore in the same way, you know? And and we I just wish that we'd valued it at the time, but we didn't know what we had. Big Chivo shoots the film coming right off of Little Princess. He's first Oscar nom? Yes, he likes yeah. another Little Princess, Brad Pitt. He looks like a pretty little princess. Dante Ferretti, of course, a three-time Oscar winner, mostly a Scorsese collaborator and a Fellini collaborator at this point, and a Pasolini collaborator. These are like he's stacking a list, like top shelf crew guys. Exactly. Um, Nancy Myers did all the interiors. That's why it cost ninety million. Yeah. Um, everyone knew the film was going to be long. Marty and you have to respect it. Said this is the movie he wants to make. Says the editor Michael Tronick. Uh, Casey Silver agreed. Bo Goldman loved it. Uh, we could line. have put together an alternate version in a week. That was not the case. We knew it was long, but movies released free holidays, the prestige factor. There's a lot of long movies. Sure. There's you another the line, line in the dossier. I, I, let's see if it's the one you're about to read. Because I do movies so rarely, I just wanted to pack so much in. It's not one of my more popular movies. True. Uh, but it's a movie I'm very proud of, and it has very powerful advocates. That makes it sound like like Thanos advocate. <laughs> like, what, is, what does he mean? <laughs> the Saudi government. Is, <laughs> and, yeah, right. Uh, and it has its detractors. Like, yeah. People yeah. complain about its length. I think what they're really complaining about is its pace, not that it's three hours, and that's a legitimate complaint. Yes. But Scent of a Woman is 92? Scent of a Woman is 1992. Right. He's like become a movie every six years guy. He That's what he is. And then he became a movie every never guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. After making a little film called Gili, which we can talk about uh, when we record that episode. But uh, I, I I talk it in my Alpha remote, you know, to order the film. By the to, way, to, to, I to do want to promise that we will talk about that movie when we record we, we'll that talk episode. About that's a guarantee. And I just, I you know, I press speak on my Alpha remote and I go, Gili. Guess what? Apple doesn't know what I'm saying. It's like, Jiggly? What are you talking about? Do you want to read reviews of <laughs> Vanessa Hudgens' production of Gigi on Broadway? 
<laughs> like I just kept being like Gili, and they're like, right, that's not a word. <laughs> you can just say that. <laughs> anyway. Another classic, like Marty, we'll give you a green light if you call the movie and the character <laughs> anything <laughs> else. <laughs> and it called anything else. I love that you got Ben and Jen. Yeah. Come on. Call like, it Vinny. <laughs> You can call it gobble gobble for all I care. It's <laughs> not Geely. For crying out loud. Call it eat me out from behind. The, the we'll put that on a fucking The poster. title of the movie is You Won't Believe What Justin Bartha Does in This. <laughs> Would it made more money probably? Yeah. We'll David's head's in his The Bartha performance. The Bartha performance. Is astonishing. Um, he got hired in other films after that. National it's Treasure crazy. is after it's that. after. After. Isn't The Hangover after too? Yeah. Way yeah. after. Yeah. But it's like National Treasure is them being like, yeah. I think we can put him in a blockbuster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can make him the Pesci in this lethal <laughs> weapon. So Men in Black, I mean, Men in Black is a great film about aliens and stuff. Meet Joe Black, however. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck did we get the Men in was, Black? Was Men in yeah. Meet Joe Black the porn parody? <laughs> Where he's decidedly um, not no, straight. It's just I'm going to find Black. out about that. <laughs> um, it's Joe Black's meat. Let's be so, clear. Put it, down, it took three passes, but Joe Black's meat is the title. There we go. Bill Parrish, Anthony Hopkins, is a media mogul of some sort. I don't know. It's, it's succession vibes, right? I We don't even really know what he does. He, I would, he, it's something I, it's in it's comms. Media. And, it's media. Yeah, like... He is contemplating a merger with another media giant. But something else is happening. Marsha Gay Harden's planning a birthday party for him. Mm -hmm. Something else is happening. Uh, His daughter, his other daughter, Claire Forlani, is maybe going to marry Jake Weber. One other thing. What? Taxis are striking down pedestrians. We'll get to that. He keeps hearing his own voice (laughs) whisper to him. Oh, right. Yeah. Which Um, I find just very evocative. Right. It is very evocative. Here's another thing I immediately clock in this movie, talking about like just the time capsule of 1998. You're like, oh, right. This is when like the richest people in the world had taste. (laughs) Like now when you see anyone like this character's house, you're like, this is the ugliest (laughs) shit I've ever (laughs) seen in the world. And you're like, this man lives in like the fucking Beauty and the Beast castle. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. He lives, he lives a nice life. It looks nice to photograph. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I would say, right, this film has no interest in engaging right with like, has he led a somewhat evil life? Like, Cause like like you say like there's the right the Gene Hackman version of like what have yeah. I built and I'm about to die and instead anything happens is like yeah I mean honestly I'm really close to my daughter yeah Marsha Gay Harden like sure she's a, she's always busy but we love each other too and uh, yeah, it's a nice place I built for myself to the extent that at the end when um in one of the th- the three goodbyes Hopkins says to Pitt um should I be scared and and Joe says. With the life you've led, no. And it's like, oh, don't worry, media mogul. Like you're, you're you've lived an unimpeachable. The, the movie actually makes takes pains to tell you that. The critics yeah. at the time, several of them noted that this film is like seemingly a weird rebuke to the "it's harder for a rich man to enter heaven than a camel to walk through the eye of a needle" thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I was watching, and I was like, if they made this today, they would not let the guy be a billionaire, right? Like, no one wants to see this movie about an uber wealthy guy. But it is kind of tied into the premise that it's like death, who is like a baby, is like, well, who would be the best person to show me life? And what he sort of learns in the process is like, this guy isn't like haunted by his mistakes. Sure. He's not like morally corrupt, but there is some deep intrinsic sadness in him. And what I do think Hopkins plays well and is cast well for is a guy suddenly faced with the like, you can't take it with you aspect of it. Right. Not the like blood on his hands, but what was all of this worth? That like you can build a great empire, but like you are going to leave it at some point. Right. What does this all fucking add up to? And I don't know if I have a second, a minute, a week, or a month left. And you're not going to inject yourself with teenagers' blood like our our present day billionaires are doing to stay alive forever. I I, would say off screen. Yeah. And have incredibly young looking penises. I mean, (laughs) for the record. Those guys look great. The a thing about the example of <laughs> we don't make rich people like we used we to. We really don't. It used to be Joe Parrish yeah. it, it wood used to burnished be, offices, not right, injecting like, his son's blood like, into his dick. I, I sit here and I do my work and yes, do I love my daughters? No, no. I'm a newsman. Yeah, I, right, yeah. And yeah, yeah, now it's like I'm so young. <laughs> this guy who looks like he's been like through a car wash. He right. just looks insane. And everyone lives in like uh, fucking Jared Leto's home from Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> and it's they're all in like the Maldives or something. It's yes. like, why do you live there? It's like, uh, reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I eat dirt. 
because they're telling me it'll give me two more years of and living. And then they're also on Twitter replying to people, and you're like, I don't. You're yeah. you're you're rich. Surely oh, right. you don't have to do that once you're rich, right? Surely there's a private rich person's version of this. <laughs> no, nah, fuck you. Like, you yeah. uh, LOL. <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah. aren't you rich? Can I'm you so just happy, like, but everything strangers say makes me cry. Isn't your life just like Minecraft? You could just go like, boop, 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 <laughs> like I built another building. There needs to be a scene in this movie where Marsha Gay Harden explains to Anthony Hopkins what the crying face emoji is, just so he, he can get a preview of what wealth is going to look like. But all the these, sideways crying face. All especially. these horrible people of our modern hellscape that we're talking about are people who are just like infinitely distracting themselves with things, right? Right, because right. Yeah. they hear the voice. They hear the yes. Well, Hop, they don't hear it. They're sure. blocking it out. Well, but they right, they know it's coming, though. Hopkins hears the yes immediately. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the key to this character is like, Especially because his wife has passed. Mm -hmm. I do think that's the reason for right. that. It's already on his mind. Right. He's and already kind of one, not foot, but toe out. He's, he's like, look, his, yeah. his career is about to end. There's something waiting for me on the other side because my wife is already dead. Marsha Gay Harden yeah. is like planning what's a sort of essentially, it's supposed to be a birthday party, but it's kind of a retirement party in a way of like, you're going to do this merger you'll be the grand old man. And right. beyond that, it has this energy of like, who knows how many years dad has left. Like this isn't his death party. But why not go big now? Because who knows? Meanwhile, Susan goes to a coffee shop up on Morningside Heights. I've been there myself. Good shop. Uh, it's the Broadway How, diner. Did, you, whenever did it's you get home okay? Well, I love to, when I cross streets in New York City, stand in the street for 15, 20 seconds, just kind of see what happens. Wistfully you know? smiling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what's weird? He Do got like home. eight double takes. <laughs> what's weird is he got home okay a week later. That's true. Showed up wearing a tuxedo and his <laughs> wife seemed to be continuing a conversation that he had no memory of. It's yeah, <laughs> they she has a meet cute with a straw haired man in a suit, right? I don't know how else to describe this scene, right? Where they're both she's quasi engaged to to what's his name Weber but Jake you, Weber. As we said, you already have the scene the helicopter where Anthony Hopkins is like, "Look, I love the guy. He's my best lieutenant. I right. think like, he's sharp I as approve, hell." But do you love him? Open like, conversation. Yeah. I really don't sense any excitement there, and I think right. you deserve more. She goes to this coffee shop. She connects to this guy. It's like sort of classic bull gold mini. Like he's on the phone arguing with someone. You think it's his wife. It's his sister. He cares so much. He's a lawyer who doesn't make any money. He has but all he these... would make money if he, he had a wife to take care of and she wanted nice things or whatever. Right. They're just immediately matching on these sort of like abstract ideals of what do you want out of your life. That immediately is a more meaningful conversation than any she's ever had with Jake Weber. Jake Weber, I think a very solid actor who I always forget is British. Yeah, he's a, he's a good douchebag. Oh, God, that's right. Say, that's so weird. He's not even a douchebag as much as I feel like his stock character casting is deeply, fundamentally unimportant person. Right. A guy where you're just like, he's not going to matter. Because right. a lot of British this guys playing it. roles like this, go full Patrick Bateman, lean so hard into douchebag right. where you're like, I want this guy to be shot between the eyes. Weber's just a little bit not it. Mm -hmm. And there's sometimes that in like a business context, sometimes that in a romantic context. He's in this in movie, the, it's both. He's in the Pelican Brief just on video as a former whistleblower lawyer who was mysteriously died. Um and he's really good in that. And then weirdly, he, like he he's playing against type in Do um, Dawn of the Dead, which I think he's very good he's, in. Yeah, and yeah. that's sort of like it's this cool guy casting. has a little more depth than you thought. Yeah. That movie has such a good cast. That movie, rolls. like Pfeiffer, uh, Mecca Pfeiffer, uh, Ming Rames. Everyone's Ty Burrell's Polly, great. Obviously, in it. Ty Burrell's really good in it. Michael Kelly's really good. And it was in the start it. of a great directing yeah. career with lots of great movies after that. I mean, it is. I can't I, believe I haven't watched The Scar Giver. I'm so mad at myself. I haven't watched either of them. Well, I'm waiting I watched, for the fucking the Metro Black length coming. cuts. It's coming. I'm They're like, coming. why should I even watch these if you're telling me these are bad? It's kind of true. Okay. The car accident scene. After you, so after this meet cute, they walk that, down the street. I just looking, want to repeat, I think doesn't work. I think they're no, just it's a not disaster. insane. You don't feel oh, what oh, they're the feeling. Oh, the scene doesn't work. You don't yeah, feel yeah. what they're supposed to be feeling. No. It and feels they, stilted. And yeah. then, like, when they're looking over the shoulder at each other over and over and over again, which out of context on Twitter or whatever looks even more insane. But even in the movie, you're like, Jesus, we get it. You know what I mean? Like, it feels like they're kind of inflating them the point just so that now, you get it in our current like media language it does feel like fucking lonely island dear sister editing right. where you're like the, yeah. oh well the bit is that another you're another over the shoulder like right <laughs> <laughs> and then of course Pitt gets hit by two cars and he goes boink boink and rachel handler at vulture wrote a scene a scene she wrote a big story about this scene considering how it was made apparently breast wanted it 
to be done with a real stunt man. Can I do the quick summation of this as in the dossier from JJ? So Bress was like, this has to be 100% real. I want not a lick of CGI, which obviously is not where it is today no. in 1998. Uh, they hired the stunt guys. They're like, if you want to do this in camera, it's going to take three weeks of concentrated Correct. stunt rehearsal. Three to, three to rigging, four weeks. Like nonstop. And they kept on being like, okay, we'll get started on that next week. Yeah. And the stunt team is like, guys, if we're going to do this, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, wishy-washy about it. And at some point they're like, could you film in five days? And they were like, no, fuck this. Stop shutting it down. I'm not letting this happen. If you right. do You're this wrong, hurt someone. someone gets horribly injured. Uh, they're like, we can make a dummy. Breast is like, dummies are fake. They're like, we can make the most expensive, high-end, fully articulated, the phone, the fingers have proper bone structure dummy. They do a life cast of Brad Pitt's entire body. Poor Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt goes into a hotel room in a G-string and they like lather him in baby shampoo and like put him in the fucking caster and get everything correct. And they're like, we'll have glass eyes Apparently, and every hair he was like, punch. destroy what you make, please. Yes, yes. Like, like never shake. use this again. Locked in eye contact. You have to promise me the molds are destroyed. Right. I'm so worried about a black market ring of Brad Pitt realistic sex dolls existing. <laughs> and they make this perfect dummy that they like hit multiple times. And they were like the only part of it that CGI is we shot the dummy. I'm sure considering breast many, many, many fucking times. And then they shot Pitt in front of a green screen, I think without telling breast. And they built a perfect foam replica of the front of the car so they could get real pit being hit full speed by the front of the car with no damage in the exact position the dummy would be in. And then right. you just About get... About 15 frames of CGI, they say. Yeah. It's truly just for the impact to transition. Like crazy cables to make the double hit work. But they never explained why they built the Jeffrey Tambor dummy. Well, that was for <laughs> black market. Right, Pitt right, right, requested right. that. Right. It was in his no, contract. No I don't know. Uh, it's actually every movie he makes. He's like, Tambor Dunning? <laughs> They're like, Tambor's not in this one. He's like, hmm? Tambor is so in the pocket in this. Tambor's excellent in this film. The problem with that scene is uh, it doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> Why does he just get hit by one car? That's enough. He would die. Yeah. Why does it have to be this comic thing? Because because getting back to it, it's like breast innate absurdist tendencies. Th it this, doesn't make any sense I'm with not, the tone of the scene. David, I'm not defending it. I'm yes. trying to psychoanalyze why he made the decisions. That's all but I'm like, saying. It's especially maddening to hear how much work people had to do yes. for one of the most mocked scenes in like 90s movies. Yeah. And a scene that completely just like, you know, to the, to the romance you just watched paid out. I get the joke of like, right. And in an instant, maybe you bounce off two cars. And it's like hackier in a way for him to just go like, uh, right, you know, like the old-fashioned car I think accident in the thing. exact same camera setup, right? Yes, if it's Maybe, just one car. Yeah, and then you cut to black the second of the impact. Right, so again, that, that's that's the boring way to do it, but, also, but it's why the, people do it that the way. The old thing is like, oh, I, you know, I, could, I could be hit by a bus tomorrow. Just have it be a bus and it kind of almost pushes him off screen or something. Yeah, and how so? have him but not stand in the middle of the street I like I do an like idiot. the moment of him almost getting hit, backing up, and yeah, then getting sure. hit by the car. Aiden but quit I, impressed I, I magic. think... We've like talked about this when you have like guys like David Dobkin Not and Aiden Quinn, Peter Whoever Fairley, right? Shit like The Judge and Green Book, yes, which are obviously both much worse great, than this. Great movie. films that you want to be mentioned in the same. Way. But these like broad comedy guys who then are like, "I'm ready to grow up." They still can't avoid like having Downey a little bit of piss on Crumholtz's shoes. They can't avoid the double pizza fold. That like the shit like that. I think this is like the 5% of like Hot Tomorrow's still in his brain. Because if this happened in Hot Tomorrow's, it would not stick out at all. You'd be like, great. Well, it would stick out and then you'd be like, damn, this movie suddenly right. has money. Nailed the effect. <laughs> sure, yes. But right, you're like, if you cut out two of the lookbacks and he gets hit by one car. Yeah. Yeah. This Should've scene. Been lightning. Just zap. Zap. That would be fun, actually. Yeah. If there's like a thunderstorm, he almost gets he's hit the by first a car. person in New York City to get hit by lightning. There's like skyscrapers. I just everywhere. like car just barely clipping him. He steps back. Woo! Lightning right. bolt. <laughs> Grand piano. <laughs> or like a bug or something <laughs> goes like bang. Yeah. But this like we're talking about early dossiers. Presses. What if Sheely shot him? That, a call forward. <laughs> the, a call forward. And at the end of the credits, it says Sheely will return. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The early dossiers, Brest was saying, like, my, like, film education was not sophisticated. It was like Three Stooges and Little Rascals. This is kind of like a Three Stooges bit. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. 
I'm trying to remember at the time. I'm not time. defending the decision. I'm just trying to understand where it came I, from. It was, I think it was yes. it was immediate, gr- immediately greeted as silly. I think even at the time, like I'm watching, be like, well, that was weird and jarring, it's so and weird, sort of shockingly violent, and, and and it weird with the tone of a film that's largely very somber and slow and like thoughtful. That you're kind of like, did that even happen? Like, it, do I remember that? In the context of how, like, again, like men felt about Brad Pitt, it felt a little bit like they were punishing him. Like, sure. Ha-ha, Fuck look that at guy. you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's comic. Yeah. It's it's like Paris Pretty Hilton boy. getting decapitated in House of Wax, except that did, this didn't actually happen in real life. <laughs> Good movie. I think also he didn't get decapitated. She gets you guys pull through her head. Chad yeah. Michael Murray's season, right? Yeah, yeah but we could do a Jean Colette Sarah season. But I consider Chad Michael Murray to be the primary auteur of his films. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, she certainly is in the uh, Brooke Shields film that I just watched. He's in a new CMM BS movie. No, the one that was out. I just watched. I I just oh, watched okay. it for the first time. Okay. Apparently, CMM is in Freaky Friday too. Thank yeah. God. Mm-hmm. Which was in Freaky Friday, of course. Yeah, uh, I think his first role actually. No, he was on Dawson's before then, I think. Uh, his first film role. Yeah, you're right. Of course he was on. He was, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, he was on, it. excuse me. Before he was on Dawson's Creek, he was on Gilmore Girls. He's Tristan. People forget. Ah, uh, okay. People forget. Want to also say I've been watching Twin Peaks for our Lynch series. It's so crazy. I already knew this because I'm a Gilmore Girls freak, but it's even more prominent when you rewatch Twin Peaks, how many people Amy Sherman Pell, you know, pulled from Twin Peaks for Gilmore Girls. Like she clearly was like, because there's so many, they share so many actors. Oh, really? And she was clearly like, I'm also making a weird small town soap. Yes, mine is not Twin Peaks, but like, right. I kind of like embracing the weirdness. Huh. It's so obvious. Like Sherilyn Fenn, Machina Ame, Catherine, Kathleen Will Hody. Like, there's They're all these all actors there, yeah. she pulls in. It's really cool. Anyway. Family dinner. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, family. Well, d- does, well, he meets death before the family dinner, right? No. During. 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 The, the maid yes. comes by and says, oh, there's someone at the front door. Well, or no, he, he says, gets is the there whisper. someone at the front door? First, he gets, he the, gets whisper the whisper that, that says, I will him be outside like the front door. Right, and exactly, he's like, right. he asks the maid, can you go check to see if someone's there? And then it turns out. And she out. goes, you're right. There was someone there. This guy. Goes in the library. I think the scene is very good. It, it's arresting. I like the way they manifest the sort of shimmery, non-corporeal form thing. I agree. Yeah, and there's good. the other thing. Until he comes out from behind the glass, it's still Hopkins doing dialogue with Hopkins where you're like two great actors working together. Yeah. And that's when, how he runs lines back at home. Of course. In Scotland, yeah. <laughs> with himself Wales, in the glass. Wales, Wales, sorry. When Pitt comes out from behind the glass, he's certainly so striking looking, but you do immediately feel the shift of he cannot sell being this like eternal force. It's a tough thing to do. Hopkins can. Hopkins can, of course. Like I was thinking about like, you know, I feel like I was thinking about personifications of death, Griffin. So obviously think at this time, you know, Neil Gaiman's death in The Sandman. Sure. Great character. Where he, right, imagines her as this kind of like peppy young woman she's like a goth but she's got like all the energy in the world and it's like such a clever reversal you know it's now it feels obvious back then it was like that's just brilliant think about terry pratchett do you ever read those books Discworld is that what we're talking the about Discworld books i yep. never did death did anyone ever read the Discworld books Mm-mm. i'm sure some of our listeners did death is a character big character in Discworld. there are several books just about him but he's in all of them because he is death and like that's this clever where it's like he looks like death like mm-hmm. the Grim Reaper. He's a skeleton with a scythe, but he's actually this kind of like quiet philosophical person who really likes people and okay. wants to get to Fair. know them. You have multiple movies all wafting off the Bergman. Like, yes, you've got Bogus right. Journey and Last Action Hero. Anything with it's like, right, like a let's do the pale guy the in the robe. robe with the right. Yeah, Scepter. Um, I'm trying to think scythe. of Scythe. I guess it's a scythe. It's a scythe. It's a scythe. It's death. death scythe. It is. It is absolutely. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find it like in film, like yeah. other. I, I guess the deaths? Seventh Seal is probably forever the king of that, right? Um, Scrooge stuff. Sure. Ghost yeah. Of your, Christmas yet to come is kind of your mm-hmm. your 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 ghost of Christmas yet to come. Films about the personification of death. Here, well, we've got a whole list. Okay, give it to me. Death takes the holidays on here. A little film called Meet Joe Black. Home, at home again. Uh. <laughs> Pico is actually playing death all along in that one. Pico, death, Alexander. <laughs> Honestly, we kind of named a lot of the big ones. Mm-hmm. Monkey Bones on here? Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg is yeah. death. You know, yeah, it's so much like of that. Brad Pitt's point of it sounding like a high exactly. class of Whoopi Goldberg vehicle. 
Whoopi is death is a little more, I would say, in the Sandman varietal of it, like of like if oh, this person's not scary at all. This person's fun, interesting. but also kind of like stressed out, overworked middle manager, right? Like, being hi, like do you know hi. how much my job sucks? Yeah. So here is death, and he's specifically intrigued, right, by the speech that Hopkins gave his daughter, right? Like that's what has piqued his interest in appearing to him you specifically. You to have some understanding of how life should be lived. Right. And if I'm going to try a week of living and try to make sense of it, you seem like a good guy. Not to mention, you got resources. Right. Not to mention uh, a uh, pool, I get to sleep peanut in a mansion. butter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You got all the stuff. Have you Talks ever had this? peanut butter, though? It's so good. <laughs> it <laughs> is. I love peanut I butter. I had it growing up. I'm, I don't even have it with toast. You just eat it. You're just spooning it. That's what this is. You must be in it a lot as a child, right? Who's child? <laughs> Good. Okay, we're back on track. <laughs> the thing is, he doesn't actually do much of that. He does a little. He does some of the stuff of like, like, what is this? Oh, interesting. But he's not like walking into a door and being like, "What's that?" You know, and they're like, "You have to open it." Like, this it's is, like he knows how to do a lot of stuff. This is what I think good at though. Right? Is like Pitt is an incredible eye actor. Pitt is so good at like looking at the other actor in the scene. And having his art, eyes dart around trying to figure out what they're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he does this incredibly well where they don't overplay the like head tilt. What are you talking about? Yes. He it can could just be, be sort of holding a movie star close up and there's just a certain weird searching blankness in his eyes. But I do feel like most people thought he was too blank, okay. right? Like that was the reaction. If at he the hasn't time. shown you yet that he really can play a guy like this with depth. You're watching it and you're like, well, this is a movie revealing this man's blankness. If he did it now, people would be like, oh, yeah, he nailed it. Exactly. I think yeah. people would be more interested. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, I do. Right. Like, think of it. I, I know this isn't a one to one, but think of like uh, uh, De Niro and Jackie Brown, where mm -hmm. he's similarly playing this guy who's weirdly kind of like blank and checked out. Yeah. And when you're watching that with like, three decades of De Niro being able to load up better than anyone in your back pocket. You're like, it's incredible that he just scooped it all out right. and gave yeah. us nothing. Right. And same with Peter Sellers and being there. But in this, you're just like, so far, I know if you wind Brad Pitt up, he can like freak out and like fight against his masculinity or he can stand pretty. Uh, he's, right. Exactly. He stand pretty. But it was he... too soon to do this kind of thing. And I understand why he wanted to do it to prove himself, but it was just like, not the right timing. Who's the right person? Not the, that's, uh, you know, there's things I like about Brad's performance or whatever, but is there someone else? It hit me really hard better? while watching it that the other guy in his class who makes a ton of sense, but I also think this would have been out of reach of his craft at the time is Keanu. I mean, Keanu would be interesting, but I think it's out of it, reach. But for wouldn't him. it have run right. into the same thing? No. The same criticism? It would, no, I'm saying yeah. it would have. Yeah. It would have. Yeah. I think he more inherently fits the vibe of what Brest is looking for. And probably would have been better at the romance, I want to argue. Yeah. But would have had similar, like, absolute nonsense. What is this? This is out of his reach. Yeah. You know, like, he looks dumb as hell scenes. But you kind of, I mean, maybe I'm just thinking this, like, but like, you you can't really do it with just some random actor you picked out of Rada or whatever. Like, it has to be a movie star. No, you have to be. Right? Yeah. But what about Joe Allman, though? Bring him in. Circa 98, too. It would have been what? Like six? <laughs> <The Kukaka. laughs> yeah, right. Just like eating out of all kinds of jars. Butler and Alordi, who are both being talked about as they're like building their movie mm -hmm. star careers as sort of like adjacent to early pit on similar trajectories. Sure. Both of those guys out of the box, innately better actors. Just like innately yeah. have better command of credit. And have been given projects that asked them to do that. Totally. Yeah. Whereas Pitt, it was this thing, and it's sort of interesting as a counterpoint to Hopkins, right? Mm -hmm. Where, like, there are some people who just arrive fully formed or build both aspects up together at the same time. And then you have people who are just, like, innately movie stars long before they actually figure out how to act. Right. But there's yeah. a thing there. And I think we just have less and less of that. Right. And Hopkins is a guy who it took 45 years for him to become a movie star, even though he was undeniably a great actor. And here's a movie where, like, these two guys undeniably hold the screen equally well. But there's a huge gulf in terms of their craft. Yes. Well, certainly. I will say I saw Jacob Elordi in the um, Paul Schrader movie at Cannes. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's about a national anthem, right? Oh, sh- yeah. You what? Yes. Cold is, Canada. Is it Cold Oh, for God, it is. Um, it's very boring. Um, but uh, Jacob Lordy plays the younger Richard Gere, which totally they look exactly one to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I found myself thinking, I think that Jacob Lordy might be too tall. He's it's possible. Quite tall. It looked it's like he was possible. sitting in baby furniture. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it was just a little too much. And like, yes. it felt like Paul Schrader had to like tilt the camera up. Like he was kind of like on his tippy toes just to get him in it's frame. Like the opposite of when uh, Marco Rubio sat in that big chair. Remember when he did that? <laughs> Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it's an interesting question. I agree with you. It has to be someone who has like that undeniable awarding. formed level of like command and yeah. presence and just like magic happening under their skin and behind their eyes. Another unsourced thing, I saw people saying that in Goldman's mind when he was writing this for Hackman, he was writing it for Cruz, and Cruz has too much. Like, Cruz would have been too in control for this. He would have been too menacing, too. Yes. Yeah, and I think DiCaprio would have been too young, but if they if they did this five years later with DiCaprio, that would be fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we've, like, kind of talked through everyone who there could have fit into yeah, it. Yeah, there weren't that there many, weren't that like, many. pretty boy movies. Because you need the gravitas of, like, this is death. Yeah. He, they have this conversation and death is basically right. Like, if you are my guide, you will not die. That's the deal, right? And so... As long as I'm, as, as I'm here, right. I'm, you're, I'm not taking And I there. like that yeah. he's like, I'm not saying you're not going to die. But you get extra time. You can hang. How much longer? Who knows? So it depends how much fun I'm having, he says. And Am I going to like peanut butter? Right. We're like, going to find out. Uh, and then Depends there's how exciting your meetings are. There's an incredibly right. There's <laughs> is there an, an intrigue happening at your company. That I, I want to sit through all of them. murder shit. Yeah, is there like a murder thing happening? Rules. So I they came have here to do three things: eat peanut butter, fuck your daughter, and learn about the IRS. And I promise you, I'll come in your daughter <laughs> so fast. <laughs> it's gonna be so fast, but the scene's gonna be long. The scene will be long, and my semen will be <laughs> dead. It's so funny that her response is, "I don't know how to put this, but it's almost like having sex with someone who's never had sex before." <laughs> It's so it's such a an it's, accidental insult. She yeah. says it like she's sort of like charmed by it. Yeah, the, but she really brutal. actually does a good job making herself sound charmed by yes. like, yo, you don't know how to fuck. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Black, uh, there's a really really brisk, tiny like five second scene where they explain what his name is to everybody. It takes no time at all whatsoever, and it's <laughs> definitely not. It's like one of those Shakespeare play things where someone's like. And will you betray me? And the guy's like, betray you? And then he like turns yeah. to the audience and is like, betray him, I shall, but I won't tell him now. You know, like, you're just like, do they not know what's going on? Yes, this, this and he's scene. like, the guy's name, names. Oh, what is his name? <laughs> I'm thinking his name is Joe. And then they all have to be like, yeah, it's like, Joe's a name. Is like, what, a, oh, what a beautiful name, Joe. And it's like, no, that's what? not how anyone will react. No. It's it. like, yeah. hey, this is my friend Joe. Joe, now that's a name. Joe's a yeah. good name. Joe. I love the name Joe. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and just have a last name or yeah. are we done? If we're done, that's fine. Let's just find out. This scene has real Griff bit energy of like, if you never stop hitting it, it will only get funnier, right? You do the England bit every single time. <laughs> um, And then, what even though, even though this, this is a new no, bit, even though this the bit is he doesn't know the bit. That's funny. We're not talking about the bit. The bit is not being discussed today. It's not the bit. It's a new bit. It's the Uber bit. Even though this film is 180 minutes long, I would say that after Joe Black is introduced and lays out his whole deal, practically nothing happens until the end. Like, yeah. A couple things happen. That basically takes an... Well, that no. takes almost... Yeah, no, that's a long build up to him. I wouldn't say it takes an hour, but he, it takes a good I, chunk of time. I just watch, I'll admit, I've watched... 40 minutes. I watched part of this movie uh, at night before sleep, part of this movie again upon wake. Uh-huh. Uh, so I was like time coding certain points. Uh, first bite of peanut butter is 45 minutes. That so makes sense. Right. And then okay. it's like, what happens after that? There's the merger drama and Jack gets... Uh, Joe Black gets with... Um, yeah, clear for there's and the party uh, must be planned. a crazy thing where you have the dinner scene where they <laughs> yes. meet Joe. Yes, and then for whatever reason, uh, Bill is like, "I want to do dinner at my house again," and to the point that his secretary is like, "But didn't you just do that last night?" And he's like, grr, grr. and so we just go back to the same scene. And basically. when he shows up again for yeah. dinner, everyone is crying, being like, "You want to see us again?" Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's this weird tone, right, where he's just like, "No, nah, don't worry about it. I mean, I know you're all planning a party for me, but I want to hang out constantly." And uh, this guy will be here the whole time, and don't worry about him either. But he certainly does not seem like an absentee father. 
that's the thing. And I really love the Marsha Gay Harden scene later. One, because she's an exceptional actor. Especially this is her era where you're kind of like, ah, she's always good. Like, you know, when's she going to weirdly win an Oscar? Right, when she quietly wins an overdue Oscar two years later. Um, But uh, that scene where she's basically saying, saying what you're saying, where she's like, you have always worked and, you know, we have our own way of talking to each other, but you have never really not been there for me. Right. It's a nice scene. Yes, it is. And like that lays out how you imagine Hopkins has been. Because yes, Claire Falani's clearly the darling apple of his eye who's not annoying. Marsha Gay Harden's a little annoying. But this feeling of a guy who is very present, but also in some ways maybe a little inaccessible while being friendly, supportive, yeah, he's not generous. making anyone do bore on the floor and, or and whatever. There's, <laughs> like, yeah, you know? there's an age difference between Harden and Forlani where you're like, maybe when Marsha Gay Harden was younger, he was a bit more distant, sure. you know, whatever. And then Forlani was you're like, right. the, the, she's oops, like 10 years old. baby. Yeah. And um, he has Forlani at an age where he is yeah. so conclusively made it that he can control his schedule a little more, right. that he can choose and, his and battles. She's, and, yeah. she's the do-over. Where he can be yes, more connected with her. And, I mean, this yeah. is the sort of breast stuff where I'm like, in in anyone else's bad version of this movie, there isn't that much thought into the dynamics, which isn't to say this movie is like subtle, but you're just like, it is clearly thought through. And that stuff sort of like bleeds into the, the sort of text of the movie. And that is sort of like 50 take shit. You know, to a certain extent of just, like, forcing this actors to live with this shit over and over again to try to find some... Totally. And yeah. Like, and I think that, like, you know, watching the, the Marsha Gay Harden stuff, she's so good at She really elevates the material. But, like, y- you could look at it from one angle of, like, oh, well, you know, okay, straight guy has to write this, you know, middle-age-ish woman character. And what's her thing? She's just obsessed with flowers and parties and whatever. But what you're actually... What you kind of are learning throughout the course of the film is that, like, Oh no, this is how she forever is trying to prove to him that she loves him, try and just trying to get him to say it back, to thank her, to whatever. So it could be anything. It not a party, maybe it's something else, you know. And I so I think if you actually look at it, like it's actually a very sensitive depiction of that relationship that, that would be flattened out and cheapened in less, you know, caring him. I agree with you. I also think there is an intelligence to the characterization of Quince, the Jeffrey Tambor character, totally. and their relationship, which is on its face, the way this movie is front-loading the don't marry Jake Weber thing, you're like, assuming the movie's going to point to the Harden uh, Tambor relationship as this is the marriage you don't want. A guy who works for your dad who's kind of a dunce, right? right? And unlike Jake Weber, this guy looks like Jeffrey Tambor. <laughs> Right, he's kind of silly. He's at like peak Hank Kingsley. He can't stop fucking up kind of mode. He drinks a little too much. Right. And instead you're like, there is a meaningful relationship there. He is fundamentally a good guy. He's a little goofy and embarrassing, but she's with him because she actually loves him in spite of everything that's a little silly. Right, exactly. This movie is crazy. It's insane. Right. Like the plot of the movie is that Jake Weber is the one pushing for, this is the A plot, honestly is pushing for this murder with some sort of corporate giant. Hopkins is initially on board because why not, I guess, and now that his legacy is all he has to think about, he's like, no, I don't want to do it. And he slowly realizes that Weber is basically just like a corporate raider sent over by the other guys to strip the company for parts, right? Like, that's what's going to happen. And Tambor is his loyal deputy who has kind of betrayed him, right? Is kind of using being used as a wedge. Yeah. But he loyal loves, deputy who married the boss's daughter. Exactly, and, he loves yeah. Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. Right, he's not a wom scam. Right, this in is, the way that he's like in, in love with his power, he actually mm-hmm. likes the guy a yeah. lot. He loves this guy. Yeah, and you're just watching this, being like, "Is no one here?" Like, I mean, yeah, Weber, I guess, but he's like, you know, like no one here is kind of like a cold blooded, like you know, Raider? rich person. Yeah, 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 like, like Tambor is just like, oh, I actually love the old man, and you're just like. It just, you can imagine audiences being like, where is like the grit to this movie? Because it's nowhere. And as, I mean, if that's the A plot, which I think I agree with. It sort of is. Then the B plot is like B, A, B, and C, right? Like they're like 1B, 2B, 3B. The three romances. PB. The three romances are Forlani and Pitt. Yeah. Which is the most straightforward in a way, yeah. right? Then there's Hopkins and Pitt, which is sort of like Hopkins learning to accept the idea of death. Right. It's kind of moving through all of the movie. And right. Pitt learning to love life right, or appreciate, right. understand it. 
And then the third one is like Hopkins with his daughters. Yes. Learning yes. to finally connect with them in the most meaningful way in his final sure. moments. And that's all meaty shit. It is kind of the corporate espionage shit. I can't say I care like about that much. Well, and also it's just weird because it's Hopkins going like, I won't do it. We're not going to do it. Right. I say no. Right. And everyone's like, yeah, okay. That's kind of a disaster for us. Also, who's this guy? And Hopkins is like, he's just here. Don't worry about it. They're like, what are you talking about? But you I can like just it. have a guy here. Joe like Black it. shows up to every meeting <laughs> right. and he refuses. Every time they ask who he is, he stammers as much as in the introduction <laughs> at the dinner <laughs> scene. One of the board member guys is like, he's had advisors before. And it's like, how many times has this happened that he's brought some <laughs> he's weird just like, Welcome, it's a yeah. James White He's just here. like collecting people and then hunting them or something. It's like, also <laughs> a little bit of what we've talked about a hot dog. with like the Dwayne Johnson problem of every modern Dwayne Johnson movie every time he walks into a room, every character should be like, who the fuck is <laughs> that? What did you do? How did this happen? They How are you looking like this? He's had other advisors before. <laughs> it's like, well, who? You're like, like this guy? <laughs> exactly. <sighs> but the tension, as it were, obviously the main tension is that Hopkins must die. He, one day this this will all get cut. You know, The original short. title of the Aaliyah Jet Li. Right? Correct. Right. They were trying yeah. to knock him off. Yeah. And he was too fast for him. He's slippery. But then the as death Joe grows closer to um Susan Forlani, mm -hmm. there's this sort of tension risk of like, wait, what does this mean? Is he going to essentially take her to the underworld? Are we dealing with a Persephone here? I feel like we've like seen... what does it mean? And like Hopkins goes from no, fall in love with the the prettiest straw colored haired person you ever meet. And then he's like, well, I would be careful about Joe Black. I don't want to say anything about the guy, but he's not going to be around forever. Right. You know, the uh, I feel like there are a lot of like supernatural comedies his cum like is filled this with skulls, where the thing <laughs> you're building to has come as filled with skulls, with skulls and it comes faster skulls. than you could ever imagine. Yes. That was the post. That was the line in the original poster. Meet Joe Black. His cum is full of skulls. <laughs> Coming, and and coming, he comes fast. Coming and the skull, the O is a skull from <laughs> October 1998. It's just coming, coming to theaters too soon. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and actually, it did probably come out too soon. It probably yeah. did. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the original trailer, the Benny Hill theme is playing the whole time. Of course. <laughs> yeah. It's he's just splooging <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. So many movies like this, the obvious, like, solve at the end is the guy has to give up his supernatural status and become a human being in order to stay with the woman. There was an interesting tension that this movie is setting up where it's like, that's not even in question. And you're sort of watching it going like, are they gonna fucking bail themselves out by doing that? Which they don't. And it, it is interesting that the original film just has him fucking take the woman. And she wants to do it. It's, yes. a, it's a voluntary thing. And I, But I like the way that they kind of deal with that in this, where uh, Bill, when he hears this plan, he's like clearly terrified and like right. doesn't want that to happen. But he can't, you mean? but he knows there's no point in like overreacting and sort of, you know, screaming and pleading. He's like, that's not how this entity works. And also realizing that like, sure, death as embodied by Joe... Um, is learning to to feel and whatever, but like he's been like some version of a stone cold sociopath f since hum time began, you know, and so he doesn't see anything wrong or anything like a big deal but with that, taking. Because well, he's barely right. a consciousness; yeah. he's basically just an idea that right. is like a function. Yeah. And again, the movie has no interest, possibly wisely, in asking questions about this, such as right, what does it mean that he's taking a holiday? Are people not dying? What does that mean? Not asking that question. Where is he from? What does he do all day? Like what, you know, right. It's, it's, it, it, it knows, I think that like, if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. Does no one die until they walk over right. a bridge? He says something about does all, he meet like the, everybody. Is he like Santa Claus? Can right. he be everywhere at once? Like, and he says something he about the house infinity, calls? like times that by infinity or whatever, sure. you know, so there is some reference to like how he can be everywhere at once right, or whatever, right. but mm -hmm. like, but they're not, but yeah. and it's like, again, it's not like, which is kind of the same as Sam man death or whatever, where, they're always like, where am I going? And she's like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm here to take you. Like, but that's that, what that's what my job is. This is one of the ideas I find kind of interesting in this movie, as much as it doesn't totally know how to unpack it, is they're not treating it like death is a guy in a hood with a skull face mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who holds a fucking scythe and lives up in the clouds or lives down in the fucking underworld. Yes. And now he has taken a human body. 
it almost treats it like this has never been a consciousness before. And now... Right? Death is like a force. Exploring being a consciousness. Right. Our, our friend Pilot's great line about Hayden Christensen in the Star Wars prequels that every yes. line is delivered like he's never said anything before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. There's Very that true. quality to Joe Black. That's yeah. not even the baby thing. It's so, like, so, how does this? Sydney you know? Sweeney too, also really good at that. I would Sydney say Sydney Sweeney, Jake Sully running around <laughs> in his avatar body, like this kind of feeling. Um, it's almost, it's almost AI. Yes, becoming sentient or something. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And I this, think I can't like, wait for that, oh, yeah. let's, uh, let's By the time this, happen. this drops, this probably. final forty-five minutes, not to zoom all the way ahead, but the final no, forty-five no, minutes zoom. of like four, three, fifteen-minute long conversation shot and type close-ups, mm -hmm. right? While Thomas Newman is, like, almost dying, like... Right. <laughs> He's playing floor, all like, ten yeah. toes on yeah. the piano He's as well. Like, Thomas Lennon yeah. is fucking the cello. <laughs> His not is full of Joe Block style. Exactly. Not fast. They are kind of trying to wrestle with, like, the darkness of this idea that feels like the thing that stopped Martin Brest from putting his second pant leg on, yeah. right? Which is like, what the fuck are you talking about? What does it mean for someone to go with death? Where he's sort of presenting his romantic idea. You have the moment and he keeps on saying like, I'm not going to be here for long. Hopkins is saying he's not going to be here for long. She's saying, I'll go with you. He's saying you can't. And you're like, when is rubber going to meet the road? And the moment she puts it all together, she immediately is like, oh, you're right. I can't go with you. What the fuck are you talking right. about? Right. What is this? And also I think he, quote unquote, you know, death, whatever, you know, it realizes like, no, you love this, this body, this person that this once was. You don't love me because why would you love me? I literally just stand around eating peanut Which butter. Is, <laughs> and and writing of like when he walks into the dinner party, she says like, oh my God, I didn't what expect to see you here? again. To right. He doesn't hear the full story. When she's actually quoting the shit back to him, he's like, our entire relationship is built on a dynamic that was established by a different person that I'm not. And also, if he has been taught anything about life and what its value is, he understands how selfish it is for him to take her well, away. That's right. what I like about the Hopkins confrontation, where he basically says to Hopkins, like, look, I'm I'm probably going to take your daughter. And Hopkins is like, like you say, he doesn't get too mad because he knows what's the point. But he is like, you wouldn't be saying this to me if you didn't think it was wrong. Like, you know there's something wrong about what you're proposing, and that's why you're mentioning it. And you would Hopkins just do it if you wanted to do it. isn't even responding like, you aren't actually in love. He's right. like, what's scary to me is I do believe both of you feel in love with each other, right. and you're not thinking through Talk what about is a actually bad boyfriend. presented. Well, sure. Dad, can you meet my new boyfriend? Oh, what, what's his job? He's the Grim Reaper. <laughs> what's his cum full of? <laughs> Certainly, it, it trickles out yeah. slowly after fully fleshed hours. heads with hair, right? Yes. <laughs> Tips unfrosted, I hope. <laughs> Chad Hardigan. He's a jelly man, yes? The director, Chad Hardigan. Griffin, yes. Loves, this, loves this film. Yes. I read his article about it. Did you read his article about I it? I did, yeah. Uh, on TalkHouse.com, mm -hmm. where he talks about how much... It was a very fun article. Because I saw on Letterboxd that he read, rated this like five stars, and it's like, this is one of the most important films to me. I understand that's basically not true for anybody else, and that's fine. Yeah, I, I uh, after recording, uh, I, well, it's another future episode, but I, I was, I saw a screening of The Wiz recently. Sure. There was a summer yeah. in the park screening of The Wiz that similarly is a movie for me where That's I'm just like... A big movie for you at the right age, too, an when you watch it. three-hour movie that everyone else is like, everything about this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it just all makes sense to me. I can't argue it works, but I'm just so on the wavelength of this thing, even though I think parts of it are unbearable. Um. But Hardigan talks about how obsessed he was with Jim Carrey when he was young, mm -hmm. much like many people our age, mm -hmm. and doing Jim Carrey impressions and seeing all the Jim Carrey movies. And then when he saw this movie with a girl in the theater when he was 16 years old, it was like one of the quietest, most grown-up movies he'd seen at that point in a theater. And like, you know, what a like, you know, obviously the films about the meaning of love and the meaning of life, right? And all this stuff. And Pitt, obviously, is the opposite of a Jim Carrey performance in this movie. He's silent. He's <laughs> observing. Let's he's say, doing zero bits, apart from one bit the Jim about Carrey how things will be version of this movie would possibly be the single worst version of this movie. <laughs> oh what is this stuff? Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yes. just full majestic hyper earnest. Yes. Yeah. The whole hospital scene is just him talking out of his butt. And that, well, that sounds pretty <laughs> good. 
Um, God, that seems funny. I did have and and like yes. he say, basically taught me to like be a, a good listener, yeah. right? Like to how to behave as an adult to stop doing fucking Jim Carrey bits. <laughs> yeah, and then he says like I've seen the film thirty more times. I really feel like yeah, it's this symphonic, you know beautifully realized like a gorgeously mounted production blah 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 but I recommend reading the article just because it, it's I, it's just yeah, a funny read I co-sign that and it yep. is it, this film just does feel kind of unique yeah it does I was I was watching it wasn't on this rewatch it was one previous uh, with all the fireworks at the end and I was like there's a lot of fireworks oh wait that's why in every play I wrote in college there is either a stage direction that says fireworks or characters refer to there being fireworks later on. And it's like, it's because I was obsessed with this final sequence. Felt like the Black. ultimate emotional heightening. Of, and it was and then fireworks and, are going off yeah. in the background while all of this catharsis and is like, happening. And like, wouldn't it be lovely if all of life, you know, all lives had that sort of happen at the end and a grand party. And, you know, I just, I I, I find as, as ponderous and probably repetitive as the final 30 minutes of this movie are, I find them captivating. I agree. I think they're yeah. kind of a triumph. They, I mean... The ending is the best part of the movie. It's just as slow. Yeah. But, right, you're kind of on the hook at this point and you're like, what is the... Like, how will this all it's play truly, out? It's if, if the movie was, like, half an hour shorter. I don't think there's any version of this movie that totally works for everyone, right? But you're like, if the party starts at an hour and 45, this movie's a lot more manageable. Mm-hmm. I, I, there's a, a friend of mine, Josh Perillo, who directed a comedy show I did years and years ago, used this term once that has always stuck with me, where he was like, you got like three pause tokens. Mm -hmm. You got three tokens in your pocket for when you can choose to slow something down to make it feel like it has more impact. And if you use that trick more than three times, it suddenly means nothing. And it starts to get repetitive. And this is a movie that's like, pockets full of pause tokens <laughs> falling in every out of its scene. pockets yes whereas like if the last 45 minutes if everything once you got to the party slowed down to this pace it would feel like levitational maybe of like i cannot believe the state of like meditative concentrated conversational intensity this film is It'd at be like cemetery of splendor <laughs> kind of yeah. yeah yeah i like joe black pretending to be an irs agent as I much like as I that. don't care about the plot line it's as a, much. It's a fun solution to that plot line. That's, but, but the writing all of a sudden becomes something totally different. It, it becomes Beverly Pitt, Hills Pitt, Pitt, yes. Pitt has, It's fucking Axel Foley pretending to be a different guy. Yeah, because Pitt has that like mini little monologue where he's like talking about the levels of whatever. And it almost sounds like pseudo Kevin Williamson or something. It's very weird. The script just kind of veers into this not, other thing. Not to repeat what I just said, but it's litmus configuration. Right. It is this right. type of scene that Brest did a bunch in his comedies. Yeah. Where yeah. a guy just finesses his way through a situation by committing really hard to a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I, I also. But it's fun. Yeah. I, I, there is just, there's an energy to that scene of like, it's time to wrap this up. This was the tension of the movie, but it's not actually important at the end of the day. And like, let's just get to the happy ending, which is like, Weber, you are disgraced. You know, company saved. Right. Tambor redeemed. Vindicated, right. Right. You know, Hopkins can sort of leave this being like, great. There's, My legacy yes. is in safer hands. There's like, a catharsis to this scene wraps up all of this in a tidy bow so the movie can go back to the emotional exactly. shit and it's only like, worry and about that. done. Yeah. And if I'm watching this movie in a theater and I paid, you know, nine whole dollars or whatever I would pay in 1998... I might be kind of like, why did we spend so much time on this given that it just kind of gets wrapped up in one neat, like, fell swoop, whatever, but whatever. You talk about in episodes in our next two consecutive miniseries that we have already recorded about sure. hating alternate unofficial cuts. I do. I mean, not hating, but like, especially, right, the type of where it's someone's basically like, I kind of made a cut. Yeah. That's not totally sanctioned, but it's out there if you want it. I, yes. I have no question that to quote Elaine May the no business cut of this movie <laughs> let's say the unmulleted cut of this film right it's long everywhere party in the front party in the back <laughs> right a lot of party <laughs> yeah um, big party I have no question it messes with the ecology of the film it, I'm sure it does but I'm I would sure be, this two hour version right yeah it doesn't really I would be very curious to just sure. see how the movie plays well, if you just don't focus on any of that shit go back in time and watch it was that on a plane or yeah on an air Somewhere, tele TV and know, if any flights? of our listeners have any ripped a version of that or a lead on it please let me know but this film is not like Gigli where 
breast is basically like after the fact, like, look, they kind of fucked with the movie beyond recognition. And like, this is the free, you know, this is the movie he wanted to make. Yeah. Like, and yeah, he as he it. says, if you don't like it, right, he'll he'll own that. Right. right. Like, you know, you don't like the pacing. The I understand. Thing. I kind of love that his attitude isn't people were wrong about that. No, he's that like, he's I hear you. Sort of like, but yeah, this I can't is argue the movie with that. I made. This is right. exactly what I made and what I wanted to make. Uh, and obviously, someone like Pitt, right? Well, like people like to get those sound bites from actors of like, ah, what the fuck? I messed that one up. But usually, and I feel like this is the case with Pitt here, it's him being like, I think I could have done a better job. Not him being like, oh, that movie's just a calamity. Like, you know, he he talks, you know, fondly about what Breast was going for. Yeah, it's interesting. I can't think of many movies that Pitt throws under the bus. There are a lot of films where he's critical of himself and says, I shouldn't have been he's there. He's critical of himself in California. I remember that. Like, there's a few, you know, where he's... Troy, he, he always talks about that way of just like, that's a boring character to me. I shouldn't have been there. I didn't have a handle, whatever. But I think it's always like incredible production. I was surrounded by good actors. Right. Wolfgang's good at that kind of thing. He always kind of avoids being like that movie was boring. Yeah. The film, do we have anything else to say about Meet Joe Black before I tell you about the release of Meet Joe Black? I, I mean, I I want to actually talk about the two Jamaican Patois scenes for a moment. I don't think we should talk about it for that much longer, but the, if you, a moment. the niceness of the we sort of the about meaning behind everything that's, right, that's bizarre wrong it. and jarring yes. about it. But yeah, I think the actual meat of it is the core of what Breast is trying to do here which is this elderly woman in a hospital. If we remove all of the cultural context of what the scene is doing, that is so distracting, right? This elderly woman with a mother who's about to go in, uh, with her daughter, rather, uh, pushing her in a wheelchair, is about to go in for surgery with Claire Frelani. Brad Pitt's there to visit her. And this woman immediately, like, recognizes him as a demon, like, starts calling him the cultural name. Well, she's like, you've come for me. Yeah, exactly. Just like, yeah, him she's, for what he is. she's close enough. I think the idea would be right, like, on the edge of death that she sees him and she's right. At the thin place. Yes. Right. And the inverse of death takes a holiday, which is getting a lot of comedic juice out of a world where death isn't possible. This is a movie where no one's talking about the idea of people not dying. And in fact, he does kill someone on screen. But it is in this sort of like dance of intimacy of almost being like, I mean, the way people talk about like death doulas. Sure. You yeah. know, where mm -hmm. it's like he exists to try to help give her a seamless transition to the other side as she's trying to come to terms with this thing. And Hopkins dies in the film as well, although in a much more Very metaphorical elegant, yes, way. way. Uh, which I also think to the sort of like visual simplicity of what Breast was doing, I, I do get choked up at just fucking... Hopkins stoically walking over that bridge with Pitt and Pitt walking yeah, back alone. And I get ch I get choked up at um the the dying woman saying like, you know, I know that you you saw a little pretty you know took a lot of pretty pictures, that's but like the, that's the fucking like, part know, that made me. We're all pretty lonely here on this side too, down here too, you know. And asking if she's ready to go, and he's like, "Did you get enough? Yeah, pretty pictures." And she's like, "Yeah." Like the idea that like yes, there are nice things in life, but they are not. Nothing is permanent. Like. I just I and think all it's of it's sad. It's, yeah, 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 exactly. Like yeah. it's it's a it's a it, refreshingly for a studio film in 1998. It does not have, it has a comforting uh, outlook on death, but not in the way you'd think. Yes, you know? and consider that within a month of this movie's release, Universal puts out Patch Adams, which if you're talking right. about like fucking deathbed, bigger right. hit, bedside manner scenes, a huge hit. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like yeah. that's the movie that's doing the absolutely disgusting saccharine version. Yeah. Of I've, this versus like Meet Joe Black, which is kind of saying something bracing, which is just like there maybe isn't any true happiness. There right. maybe isn't any real meaning to this. It's like collecting the moments, telling it's a trip, telling a yeah. manifestation of death itself. Death actually isn't that scary if you think about it, because life doesn't really make that much sense. And as you said, you just hope you come away with it with a nice, uh, enough nice moments. Yeah, it's like uh, in, in Let Them All Talk, you know, um, the, the, the cruise is actually life. Right. All of life is a cruise. You're just on a journey from one place to the next and it's full of weird, you know, whatever. Like, and I, that stuff can, can be corny, but I don't think it's corny in, in either case. And there is a bluntness to her performance and a lack of, um, like a, a, a razzle dazzle, like fireworks. You know, the stuff that Breast is trying to avoid in the making of this film that's very similar to what Hopkins is doing, where it's just like, 
this is lived in. This is someone who is speaking from some real well of feeling and does not need to dress it up. And then it's this perfect encapsulation of the entire movie. That scene is playing against an uncomfortable looking Brad Pitt doing the most ill-advised right. dialect <laughs> imaginable. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of the whole movie's right there. It is like the movie's greatest profundity and its greatest mistake. Yeah. Right. There it is. Right. Literally right. in conversation with each other. Whoa, guys. Um, I don't even know how to... I just... Uh, I feel like I've been microdosing. Okay. I don't even know where that episode went. What episode do you think we're recording right now? What's the last thing you remember? I don't even know. We've been jumbled up in our recording schedule so much. I feel like I might have been acting weird. I'm sorry about that. Well, no, we were at the coffee shop. Yeah. Right, right. And I we remember were that. Vibing. Yeah. <laughs> that we were all getting horny. Mm -hmm. There was a four way fuck. You guys, fuck I don't know. This is maybe up. crazy. Were you talking about cum bones? Yeah, we were talking about cum. cum might have come up. Cum yeah, skulls. Not my finest hour. <laughs> yeah, semen bones. Wait, cum skulls. I don't yeah. know if I like came across as acting like kind of goofy. Like walking into scenes, kind of just like not saying anything and like, you know, shooting thought, scenery. Ben, or, I actually thought you had a lot of presence. I, okay, I cool. will, I will yeah. say, Ben, I really wish you'd been able to know my father. There is a weird backlash, I will say, though, against what you just did that's kind of building out there. So watch out for that. People are mad. But but then people are going to... I don't see anything behind me. <laughs> it's right behind you. <laughs> ben, just to talk you through this. Yeah. People are going to be mad. Yeah. Then uh -huh. they're going to totally forget about right, it. Then, but then, yeah, just do some other stuff and they'll be fine. And then like 15 years from now, I'll get a lot of attention, maybe for the wrong reasons, but it's kind of innocent and just innocuous. keep an eye out for YouTube. Yeah. Do you think when YouTube was created, Brad Pitt was like, oh, oh no. fuck, they're going to put the He's fucking like, car crash <laughs> and the fucking yeah. Jamaican patois. <laughs> Well, either, so and the peanut butter, which is kind of like, is this the first major Brad Pitt eating movie to this degree? Yeah. No, I can't speak to like Johnny Suede or right. Those really early ones. I haven't seen them in a long time. Definitely not the first time he ate on camera, but the idea of multiple yes. scenes where you're just watching him lick a spoon for minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of doing a Brad Pitt face. But all bits aside, this movie does really watch like your friend took three hits of acid and is just trying to act normal in front of your parents. <laughs> that is what the acting is. That you're not. And then your parents wrong. are like, what's your friend's name? And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you his name. It's coming. <laughs> first name's going to come first. Some of, the, some of the scenes where Pip <laughs> Almost there. walks in in like a loose suit and you just see him not know what to do with his hands. Mm -hmm that I think are borderline subtle. <laughs> yeah, there's just choices kind of that are, yeah. right, that are actually more than just he's standing there. Like, it's he's not just, like, going limp and blank. Like, there is choices. Yes. Did this movie hit you at all emotionally, Ben, or were you too... No, yeah. the, the end was effective. Yeah. Got me, for sure. Yeah. There's, there's stuff in here. There's stuff. For sure. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what else was in Meet Joe Black. Mm. The trailer for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Yeah, this weird thing where the trailer was not exclusively attached to this movie. This no. was a Universal movie and that was a Fox movie. True. It was on some other releases. I remember the weekend this movie came out, not to get ahead of the box office game, although this would have been a more limited release. Uh, I, I yeah. remember well, being... Well, it was a pretty... Well, no, no, but I'm about to tell oh, you. Oh, okay, okay. I remember being very angry that as weekend movie outing with the family... My parents voted Waking Ned Divine when I desperately wanted to see Meet Joe Black because of the trailer. Uh, and sure. I was so fucking grumpy being dragged to Waking Ned Divine and then the fucking Phantom Menace teaser popped up before it. And the relief I felt where I was like, well, now I can enjoy Irish people. I mean, uh, taking a child to Waking Ned Divine is... <laughs> I, oh, you I had a though. great time, yeah, especially okay, when I was fucking running off the high of Jar Jar Binks. Right, right. right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is true that, yes, this film has acquired the reputation of being the movie that you had to see to see the Phantom Menace trailer, when in fact, sort of a the trailer was attached got to control. everything right. that was in theaters. And then there was this belief of like, well, everyone bought tickets to Meet Joe Black and then left after the trailers and didn't watch the movie, which doesn't explain why this movie opened poorly. Like, that math has never mathed for me. Yeah, maybe it would have opened even worse. I don't know. That's the question. Are you arguing that this movie would have made a $10 million opening weekend if there weren't Ain't It Cool posts about the trailer maybe being in front of it? Maybe. Um, the film didn't do very well. We'll talk about the box office in a second. Did it, okay overseas. 
Yeah, because of the pit factor, yeah. it ends up making one. Well, it does. Wait, let me find the number here because fucking the numbers doesn't have it. Did it did like 40 domestic. Did 44 domestic and like yeah. 140 worldwide on a 90 budget. I mean, it's not a. It's not no, great. no one's right. happy. Um, I remember this getting a. Two- it got obviously not. No, no awards attention. Sure. I remember Which getting, it was supposed to. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, yeah. Uh, uh, two disc, uh, high end packaging special edition DVD at a time where two discs had barely been breached as a concept. It felt arrogant almost to do. Hubris. And I remember holding it up at the video store and being like, this got two discs? And it's like, oh, the second disc is Death Takes a Holiday. Oh, that's That fun. was the thing, which oh, I thought cute. was fun, but I was like, it's not like you did like fucking 20 hours of special features. You just put a second movie on there. Uh, film film got bad reviews. Mm-hmm. Ebert liked it. Ebert, I think, liked it more than Son of a Woman? Possibly. He gave it three stars. Everyone else of the, of the big critics, I think, did not really like it. Thought it was treacly and slow, uh, which it is. You can't, can't argue deny that. that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And both of those things. It's not a movie any of us are going to argue is a masterpiece that everyone's wrong about. No, I'm not going to argue that. But I was interested by how much I sort of vibe with what it was going for. I could see myself rewatching it. I could see myself getting in the mood. Will I ever watch it straight through beginning to end in one sitting? I don't know. But if I heard there was a rep screening happening of this... I'd be a little curious to curious see how it plays a in a theater. Right. Sure. If yeah. they were like, there's a 35 millimeter print of Metro Black and you can sit in a room with strangers and see how people ride. And out it was like a hundred degree day. I'm like, hey, oh, great. Yeah. Get me in there. Absolutely. Um, the film came out November 13th, 1998. It's mm-hmm. opening. Oh, flubber time. Flubber season. <laughs> yeah, we flubber? already covered that was a year earlier. Flubber is 97. But the same time of year. But it is right. No, that's what I meant. It yeah. is forever. No, it's it's flubber, what it's Hollywood season. calls it's, flubber, it's season. flubber season. What kind uh, of yeah. flubber season this year? Uh, well, wicked, wicked. Oh, the it's flubber, got the which is green. Slot. What color is flubber? I was going to say green. She's sort of flubbery in yeah. a way, yeah. and then she's green. Yeah. What else and there's is a green? mad scientist. Do you remember when flubber came out and they had not advertised that it was part one of two? Yeah, and people got so mad. People got so furious. Right. It ends with flubber uh, ascending into the sky. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and you're the car evil. starts flying, and you yep. don't know if it's going to oh, land or not. Speaking of flubber, Marsha Gay Harden. Yep. Is she in Flubber? Yeah. Sure is. <laughs> is she in she Flubber? Sure that's a, that's yep. a sign that I haven't seen Flubber since You're 1997. You're forgetting that the opening of Flubber is I'm that Robin I'm forgetting everything Williams. about Flubber, to be clear. <laughs> Gotta give Flubber another stint. <laughs> All right, so there's the no. professor. Have you heard of nuts? Another yeah. bounce, yeah. please. A true bounce. I mean, it is about, but I'm just saying Flubber bounces yeah, around. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. The opening of that film is that Robin Williams is so busy working on perfecting his recipe for Flubber, he forgets to show up to his wedding. Yeah. That's right. Because, of yeah. course, it's a remake of The Absent-Minded Professor. And it's the way they money. update that for my times is he's so absent, he doesn't show up. It opens number three at the box office, Griffin. $15 million. Okay. And where was Flubber in the box office? Flubber is not seen here. I do not see Flubber. No a year flop. later, it was already out of theaters. It's already out of theaters. <laughs> it's not in its 50th week. It was like Ben-Hur. It just... <laughs> Kept coming back. <laughs> Number one at the box office is wa- a holdover from last week. Okay. Uh, it was a gigantic hit. In what genre? Comedy. It's a funny. It's a laugher. Oh, it's... I uh, just want to see if he gets it from this. The Waterman? What? Jesus Christ. It is The Water Boy. It's Adam Sandler as The Water Boy. Yeah. Um, I still say... Anytime I'm saying to my partner or anybody, you can do it. I say, you can do it. You have to. I can't. I, I, and that's 25 years of that. There's, 26 years of that. There is simply no choice. You can the do Water it. The Waterboy might be the stupidest fucking movie he ever made, right? <laughs> I like, did a it's pretty serious. Like <laughs> it's it's funny that Kathy Bates had Titanic one year and then that the next year. I did What's a pretty stupid serious uh, <laughs> what? Okay, well, I would check with your time code, right, to find the stupid part. It's starting at minute zero 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 zero, <laughs> and then watch it till the end of the movie. And you're going to see... All right, what were you saying, Griffin? No, I did a pretty serious uh, Sandler, Sandler. Uh, blind spot uh, filling and rewatching, and that movie just is so strange. It it's is really so weird. weird that that was like his breakthrough. That's where they're like, congratulations, you are now mm-hmm. the ultimate A-lister. Well, it, it's hit the moment also, right, where it's like, I whatever you pitch is green lit. Yeah. Because if this worked this big, like, yeah, you must just like be good at everything. I like, think it was when he was on uh, Conan's podcast, but he was talking, Conan was saying how strategic Sandler always was about his career, that people thought he was dumb. And he really thought about things right. at length. And he was like, well, like wedding singer 
was an, a point where I felt like I need to try to play slightly more of a real guy. Yeah. Let me test if people will buy me as romantic well, I think that was crucial to his career Absolutely. that he did that. Yes. And that comes out, I think, in February of 98. Yes. And February. then Waterboy is November of 98. And then May or June of 99 is Big Daddy. Waterboy is sandwiched with, between two movies where he's trying to find the middle ground of like in the, in, stunted right. adolescent rage, but I'm playing a real guy he's who can have guy real who emotions. Like pay, pays rent and like knows where his keys are and right. like can like make pasta in and a pot. In between, like, he in made like the most bananas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where you're like, do you think the guy in Billy Madison was like a little too put together and smart? Great. Right. Like, here's the and, water. And, the whole and that was the was one where America accent. was like, yeah. congratulations, you were yeah, elected mayor of Hollywood. It's he's also like, after years of him being on SNL and everyone being like, I'm kind of sick of the guy who just does that fucking voice. He's like, well, the whole movie is me it's doing voice. that voice. Yes. <laughs> and people are like, yes. <laughs> and it's like a plot. You can do it. <laughs> a plot that is almost as sweaty as Ratatouille, where you're like, what is the internal logic? His anger is so repressed that if he visualizes the football as something else, he can kick it really hard. Right. But only if he can redirect the anger and then it can turn into something else. The Water Boy is number one. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's making twenty four million dollars in its second weekend, so it's Jesus. made eighty mil oh, in a, in two weeks. Yeah, it opened a forty. Huge hit. It did. Yeah, and it's going to end up making one hundred and sixty one million dollars. Humongous. Uh, number two at the box office, and I think this is the one it kind of stings to be opening below. Uh huh. Waterboy, you can at least be. Not I'm sure Martin Brest watched weekend. the Water Boy with a pretty straight face. Like I don't think Martin Brest was like. Uh, a worthy opponent, like, but at least he's but like, look, the movie's a phenomenon. That's what I was it's a say. big hit. It's a phenomenon. This one is a horror sequel, okay. and it's opening to sixteen point five million dollars over Meet Joe Black. It wouldn't be. It's too late for Scream Two. It's not a Scream, but it's certainly in that ballpark. Is it? Uh, I still know. It's I still know what you, you did, did last, last summer. You don't want to lose no. to I still know. We're like. The whole joke is the title. Mm -hmm. They've done no other work. Correct. They're like, How, I know what you did last summer is a great title for a Perfect. horror movie. That movie is fun. And they're like, should we just do a, should we just like do a sequel that's called I Still Know? <laughs> should we just do that? What if we, yeah, they, it was like a joke that then they were like, but wait else, a second. Like, let's just, just fucking do it. Do it. Like yeah. someone's like, should Brandy be in it? Like, like let's just put Brandy in it. Let's put Jack Black dumb. in it. Yeah. And he's a Rastafarian. <laughs> Everything's going to be Irie. Um, so I still know what you did last summer, which I think I've seen, but I have no I've memory. Seen. I've never of. even seen the first one. The first one is fun. Yeah, it's not like a brilliant film, but it's, you know, it's perfectly good. Fun. The fisherman. He's yeah, he's a, yeah. he's got a hook. Yeah. And he knows what you did last summer, but certainly he doesn't still know. He uh, must've forgotten. By he'll him. always know. Okay. Right. That was the third one. Um, Top tier Ryan Felipe in that movie too. I believe they're making a new one. Yeah. Top tier Ryan, but that's in, I know. I still know the no, only survivors, is... spoiler alert, are uh, uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prince Jr. The rest have died uh, at the hands of the hook guy. Mm. Including Pete Sampras's future Brigitte wife. Brigitte Wilson. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, so that's beating me, Joe Black. Number four at the box office. Oh, we mentioned this director. Um, hmm. Thriller, big movie star. Uh, I think this movie's kind of bad. Is it Gibson? <sighs> no. Is it Gear? New is it? It's not Cruise. New big movie star like that. Yeah. A list here. It's not a four. In my IMO, yes. Um, but it's a little debatable. I mean, to me, no. But to others, maybe I don't know. <laughs> big movie star. Uh, adult thriller. Yeah, it's a, a big action thriller. It's kind of like a, you know, what if this terrible thing happened kind of movie. I don't know. It's really hard to describe this movie. Huh. And it's a director I already mentioned. Yeah, we mentioned him. What studio? The studio is uh, 20th Century Fox. It's not... Well, you said it wasn't Mel. I was going to say conspiracy theory. It's not any, any of the state. No. no that's the next 20th year. Century Fox. It's a little closer Big to star. the vibe. Director we've already mentioned. What if this happened? Yeah. So it's got a big star. Oh, it says it's it's the siege. Wow. I was about to start oh, queuing up I, the Bruce Willis as well. I think that's well. a fascinating movie. It is politically fascinating, it but I do think it's kind of the Civil War of its time. In yes. the way, if you yes. read all the hand wringing in the press leading up to its release. Yes. I would yeah. say it's stupider than Civil War. Uh -huh. And I might have my issues with Civil War, but I think the siege is a little dumber. Um, but yes, right. You know, speculative, like the day after tomorrow kind of like terrorism is suddenly everywhere and blah 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 uh, Denzel 
Annette Benning, Bruce Willis. It's a big, big trio. Yes. Uh, Bruce Willis with the and. Mm-hmm. It's an Edzik, Edwick movie, obviously. Um, number five at the box office is an animated film. Is it Anastasia? No. Hmm. Is it the Rugrats movie? No. Huh. 98? Mm-hmm. Mulan? Nope. It's not yet A Bug's Life. That comes later. But what is it? If it's, it's not A Bug's Life. Uh, it's Ants. 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 Ants with a Z. Ant with a Z. Ants. You ever seen Ants, Ben? Ants. Ants. Oh, right. You haven't seen any movies. No, he's back. Oh, right. You're back. Ben's Sorry. back. You ever seen Ants? <laughs> uh, no. Okay, great. Written by... I saw Bug's Life, though. Written by your friend Chris Weitz. He did write it. Uh, number six at the box office. Ants is... Uh, it was a big movie for me when I was 12 years old. Yeah. I thought it was so clever. I had um, score on CD. That's weird. <laughs> That's Are you surprised? <laughs> Who did the score to Ants? It wasn't Henry mm, Gregson Ants. Williams, I don't think. Oh, the score, of course, was done by Harry Gregson Williams and John Powell. Yeah, there we go. Uh, number six is Jonathan Taylor Thomas's I'll Be Home for Christmas. Well, you should have let me week. guess. No, I could have you. guessed that, too. That, that movie bombed. Would you, you saw that opening. Yeah, you're well, telling me this movie opening at be, three mil oh, bombed? Because... Uh, you seen that one, the, Benny? Adam, no. His rival in that movie went to my college. Ooh. And so Beale was at Tufts, and she would come visit him uh, on campus, and it was like a big thing. There he is. That was like his one JTT. kind of transitional to grown-up movie. I think so, yeah. It's the yeah. only time they're trying to put him above the title, he basically. He basically retires from acting after that. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, he was above the title man of the house. He just had to but split it. You're splitting it with the, the grown up. Right. You know, when he got even with dad or wait, who could know? No, that, that was, was man of the house. What about Wild right, America? Right, right. It was him and Chevy. Right. Wild America was him above the title with Sawa and Bearstow. Right. This was his lone. He'll be home for Christmas. And it's he's a really in a Santa suit. And and he's, yeah, I remember it by sucking. A, it's bad. Just, yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't think there's any defenders of this film. Oh, my sister. You can probably she can Number one. seven at the box office is Pleasant Film. Yeah. Number eight of the uh, box office is some weird old movie I've never heard of called The Wizard of Oz. Speaking of Wicked. Yeah. Number nine is... uh, Yeah. We did the the Triple Crown in this one episode. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't talk about Oz the Great and Powerful. (laughs) Well, that's a quadruple crown. You can't mention him. (laughs) He's Um, too powerful. Number... Nine of the box office is Living Out Loud. The oh, uh, Richard LeGravenet. Hunter, yes. yes. Danny DeVito, Queen Latifah, three-hander. Just a perfect, the obvious three amigos. The big three. DeVito, <laughs> Hunter, film, and Latifah. I, I honestly remember when it came out, but like that was a film right where I'm, when I'm a kid, I'm like, well, this is for grownups. I assume that it's just about them having to like do their taxes or something. Right. Like it's so beyond. If me. I watched it today, would I think it's like a Mike Lee film? Would I be like... Possibly. It, it, it might be good. Yeah, it was like a TIFF movie, mm-hmm. you know. Number 10, a film I like, mm? Practical Magic, a getting a leg sequel. But I, as much as I like Practical Magic, them being like, we're doing a Practical Magic Legacy sequel, I'm like, you guys are are officially done making Legacy sequels. Did you, and it's not a Legacy sequel, but it just dropped today. Have, did you guys see the Red One trailer? Uh, I did, but then um, my eye went blind. <laughs> <laughs> One second in, I lost my sight. I was about to watch and then Joe Black my, showed uh, up in my apartment. Yeah. <laughs> my <laughs> ocular nerves <laughs> detached. And then when it was over, they reattached and they were like, don't do that again. And Joe Black grabbed my laptop out of my hands and carried it over a bridge. <laughs> I agree. Before uh, I could finish watching. It, um, it's one of the bleakest things I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. yeah. Really? For a film? No. It, it, based on an idea uh, by The Rock's ex-brother-in-law? It's even, it's even bleaker than expected, I will say. Yeah. Anyway. What's it about? It's right. about... I just threw it on. It, it's basically a serious, quote-unquote, franchise version of the fucking Black Hawk Down Santa Claus South Park episode. I guess so. It's yeah. like Santa Claus is kidnapped <laughs> and they have to send in specialists. And Santa Claus is supernatural like a bounty hunter. So J.K. Simmons, muscle. Academy JK Award Simmons. winner J.K. Yeah. Simmons is is Santa with muscles. He is. He is. He's doing reps. Right. I will say he's lifting. And I think like Dwayne Johnson is Dwayne like. Johnson's like his bodyguard. What the? Fuck he's like that? an elf, and Chris Evans is like a bounty hunter. Yeah. Yeah, and then like they fight like Krampus, Lucy. <laughs> No, no, they don't. Or they're just like you be cr- quiet. And then they, they fight big snowmen. <laughs> David, you like, might be surprised to hear they think it has huge franchise potential. It could branch out to all the other holidays. I, why egg does one? every movie have to be about like... Easter uh, egg one? <laughs> Pumpkin one? Arbor one. <laughs> oh, there's a polar bear. Groundhog one? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, the polar bear is sassy. Tree. Tree. 
I just hate this movie where it's like, did he just say tree? <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> you know, Chris Harvard Evans being day. like, you know, hey, my job is I drink coffee and I got a beard. What do I do? Don't worry about it. And then it's like, sir, listen, you don't know this, but Red One has been kidnapped. What are you talking? Santa Claus? And then like a polar bear shows up and he's like, what's going on? That like, seems to be the vibe. Twice a year, Chris Evans, you just hear whispers that it's like, he might be done with acting. He's getting disillusioned. He wants to walk away from it all. And I'm like, Here's my advice, buddy. Stop making red. Yeah, the worst. Don't films you have enough money for the right. love of God? Don't 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 make. You're red gonna one. do fucking like ghosted gray man red one. Like there was an uninterrupted five movie a, run. You're right. That is absolutely astonishing. It's crazy. Actually. Yes. Yeah. That's like I would quit the business yes, too. Like, right. I, like, but instead, so he seems depressing. to be addicted to shit. Yeah. <laughs> to eating shit on yes. screen for no one's for entertainment. Like $50 million up front. He makes knives out, and everyone's Profit. like, man, this guy has the juice. Yeah. What's he going to do next? He finally and he's hung like, up the shield. I'm going to fart into the wind. <laughs> <For laughs> Goodbye, quality. And also, like, basically be complicit in like the destruction of the industry by taking these insane up I front would say these things residual are, buyout right. salaries. They, in a way, they actually kind of had to happen like Netflix had to make these 250 million dollar movies that zero people remember and then like it just kind of has reordered things back to yeah Netflix movies are DTV garbage or art house you know in objects of interest they are not making blockbusters they tried they failed no one's going no one cares the end here's his entire career post knives out right 2019 oh, yeah. Hangs up the shield, end game, goes out on top, knives out. People are like, he might have a good post Marvel career. He does eight episodes of Defending Jacob for Apple TV that we all remember. Mm -hmm. People watched that, but no one remembers sure. He defended. In 2021, he plays Chris Evans in the movie Free Guy. Oh, I have to go. <laughs> in Don't Look Blind Up, again. He plays the role of Devin Peters, that, which I would argue is basically Chris Evans in the movie Don't Look Up. I don't even remember that. He appears in the movie about oh, fuck where he's playing, yeah, whatever. whatever. But like yeah, both like, of those are him parodying his own right, thing. Right, he does right, two right. cameos in 2021. Yeah. 2022, Lightyear and Gray Man. Oof. 2023, Ghosted and Pain Hustlers. Yeah. And Pain Hustlers is a Netflix movie, but it, you, in theory, are like, oh, okay. That's like a true story drama. Sure. Is there something there? I mean, I haven't seen it. Nothing. I it's, assume nothing. It's not good. And then 2024 yeah. red one. I mean, Emily That's Blunt it? is good. That's the whole run. But isn't he... Didn't he's he doing finally Celine take some Song's movie now? Yes. Okay, so that's and like... he's like, doing right. the new uh, uh, Cohen movie. Yeah, Honey Don't. Yes. Which is a funny title. The singular Cohen. Uh, uh, and he well, did the, return uh, to Scott Cohen, Pilgrim. Uh, uh, Cook. Yeah. You co-starred with him and Scott Pilgrim yeah, takes off. Yeah, we spent off. so much time together. Uh, so there's, he did do that. He's sort of, yeah. you know, right? The Menchie move of like, yeah, I'll be Lucas Lee. for scale. Yep. yep. And I'm sure he'll be filming the red two or three, you know, because the movie is going to do so well. And there's so many numbers. The trailer actually takes embarrassing pains to say it's going to be in theaters. And it's like, thanks, guys. Who's going to say? Uh, yeah. And anyway. theaters are like, eh, seriously, you don't have to. Oh, you, know, <laughs> you know, we're just going to re-release Inside Out 2. Yeah. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I know we've been it. complaining about not having enough yeah, product, but, but uh, actually. We found this old print of a movie called Meet Joe Black. We think we're going to put that on. He's making a movie with Romain Gavras, who made that movie like Athena, that like yes. that action movie. He's finally got a lineup with of Anya movies Taylor that Joy feel and Brendan Fraser. Like and he's Salma taking Hayek. some risks. Okay, that right, sounds right, real. Where you're like, right, that's sort of interesting. Yeah, he's got like three real movies in a row lined up. But he's also got Red One. Well, Red One was also shot like three years ago. What They've are you been talking about doing Red One had normal production. Triage, nothing weird on happened. That thing. They had one script that they worked on. Everyone showed up on time. People only peed no in toilets. No one was tired. <laughs> <laughs> People peed in toilets privately. Yeah. Urine went to the one place it should go. <laughs> That's what it says in the end credits. It's just... No animals were harmed. And also, also... People peed normal. Every on this bottle production. empty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could check. We have the <laughs> bottles. You No weird smells. <laughs> Richard, do you have any... Closing thoughts? I mean, I don't, I wonder if anyone listening to this, because I, I sometimes listen to your episodes where, and, and it's a movie I haven't seen. Very kind. Of um, too kind. I actually, a, a, lot, a, a lot I do. Um, but uh, I, yeah, it's the kind of thing of like, would I recommend this to somebody? Yeah. I, the only thing I would say is I don't personally feel it's bad in exactly the way it got a reputation for being bad. I think, I mean, I like the movie, but I think that like, 
if you think it's just like 90s studio pablum yeah i I, I think it's firmly not and i i know i basically made this point already but i'd restate that all of the most insane things you've seen abstracted into memes from this movie remain insane in the context of the film fully but they they're there is some internal logic to the insanity, which is not yeah. to say that they work. No. But when you see the clips, you're just like, how could any movie get to this point? <laughs> right. It's like it's like that clip that went around of the editing from Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. in that one scene. And you're like, I mean, that movie's not good, but like, but I think that in, in the case of Micho Black, the context does help a little bit because you're, I, for me anyway, I'm more on the movie's side. And so I'm like, oh, this is, they probably shouldn't have done this, but, but I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't detract from what's around it. And it's it. also just fascinating where you're like, okay, this being a failure and kind of being the first genuine bounce of Breast's career, yeah. not kind of, really being. Was, yeah. Yeah. The only like unqualified bounce of his career up until this point. You're like, so how does he pivot now? Does he go back to comedy and try to go back to mm. his roots? This is what he tries to do and fails at. Or does he, like, stay in this adult prestige zone but figure out how to, like, get it a little more under control? I wish he'd Show a little more discipline. I wish he'd... St I mean, knowing what we know about what, yeah. what was to come next, like, I wish he'd stayed because I think, you know, uh, Mingela had, what, two more movies in him at this point? Uh, or three, I guess, if you can't... Rip Ripley was... Yeah. Um, but, like, you know, Mingela was near... Uh, unbeknownst to us, nearing the end of his run... And I, I just think that big, high-grade, meticulous, epic filmmaking, we lost... I mean, you know, I would have loved to see if Brest could have, like, been one of those people because he, the promise is there in this movie. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I do think in 1998, as much as, like, heads rolled over this movie, Sense of a Woman still looms so fucking large. Like... There's a certain amount of cachet you still swing around from being like, this is the guy who won Pacino as Oscar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that movie is like going to play on fucking cable TV forever. Yeah. Now it's... It's a relic. It, it's just like... Uh, it's a relic. Tom Sizemore is guarding it in a museum. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Linda Hunt's Thank there you. too. Yeah. Good, good movie. Penelope and Miller, right? Yeah. Uh, yep, Richard, Penelope. anything to plug? Oh, you can read my work at VF.com. You can listen to my podcast, plural, mm. Little Gold Men, which is like award season movies and then still watching right. I don't know when this is dropping, but I think we're still going to be soon. covering week to week uh, HBO's House of the Dragon, which is a, a spinoff prequel to a show called Game of Thrones. Never heard of it. This is a July episode, right? Yeah, July 7th. We're okay, doing so it we'll, style. we'll still be in Westeros um, talking about Child murder characters who cannibalism. all have this aversion of this. There's a Reina, a Rainus, a Rainera. It's just like, come on, me, me, throw us a bone, please. Hey man, I can't wait to never watch this. And part of the rule is that like we really are supposed to refer to the character names, not the actor names. Yeah. And I, I basically have like a lexicon in front. Like I just this huge gu guide guide in front. Yeah, of me but luckily I, they all have the same color hair. So yeah. it's really easy to distinguish between Targaryens. This is why I think the show is successful, but where they were like, we're gonna do a whole Targaryen show. I'm like, all the Targaryens look the same and have the same name. That's the whole deal with them. I, you, they should probably be off to the side. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I so there's like it, forty of them. I want to make it very clear. Unlike what some people think, I don't like wa not watch Game of Thrones in some anti like I'm not like mm -hmm. the other guys kind of thing. Yeah, you just it's just know lack of just interest. Like, right. But anytime anyone talks about it, I feel such a sense of relief of this being a pop culture blind spot for me. Where I'm like, I'm not even saying I think I would hate it, but it just sounds like, like it. work. It's yeah, I love I, mean, I I enjoy I enjoy the House of the Dragon and the podcast yes. is fun, but it's just funny like to be like oh, w w I remember recording the first episode of the season and being like, holy shit, I'm never gonna get these names. Cause there are characters who are named a uh, twin brothers named Eric and Eric, and they you're fight. supposed to keep them apart. Yeah, but then they fight. Then they fight. I mean, I read the and book. That's not. I know they fight. Okay, it, that episode will have aired by now. So anyway, that's the longest plug uh, ever. Great. No, um, but yeah. yeah. There cool. Meet Joe Black. Yeah, if you see Joe Black, uh, let us know. Obviously, watch out for him. He's yeah, if still you at see large. Black, uh, Joe Black, call your local authorities. Yes, call 911. Jake Weber Black. tries. It doesn't work. And if your cum is full of skulls, yeah. immediately. Uh, that's a, you yes, should also uh, your Roman yeah. or hymns or whatever can probably yeah. sort that out for you. Yes. <laughs> If you have uh, cum skulls. AG1. <laughs> yeah, right. Many of our sponsors could help you <laughs> in this right. area. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Rebardi for helping to produce the show. 
AJ McKeon for our editing, also being our production coordinator. Joe Bowen, Pat Reynolds for our artwork. JJ Birch for our research. Leigh Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon Blank Check special features. We do franchise commentaries. We're finishing up the Turtles. We're maybe just ending the Turtles and moving on to we tabletop are, of games. Of course. Uh, yeah, we still got a couple turtles left. We got one turtle left. Okay. Uh, actually, next is our Spreadmaster Delight episode. Oh, well. There you go. Look at that. Look at that. By popular demand. Mm -hmm. I guess. Sure. Sure. David is very patient with me in that episode. And Am I? Are you I, being annoying? You remain even keeled. <laughs> I don't have no memory Hurry of that up! <laughs> oh, you take forever being like, and my five. I'm, I'm, four, I'm sorry I don't have fucking 80 years locked and loaded. Yeah, maybe you should. That's the exercise. Maybe lock it up. That's the exercise. Uh -huh. Tune in next week for the end of our Martin Breast series. Of course, he goes out with a bang, Geely, 20 years ago. Geely. Uh, and as always, everything going to be Irie.